Yeah, bless up everybody. We're here live and direct. Um, everyone tuning into the live, those are here. Good things. We're going to talk about business, you know, um, the big saying that uh, people like to say these days is standing on business. So today we're going to stand on some business, all right? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to that blessed love, sweetie. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to talk about uh, businesses in the United States and businesses in Africa. Um, those who have followed me for some time know that I'm a world traveler. And the question is, how are you able to travel the world and still take care of uh, whatever economic responsibilities that you have, or how are you able to travel the world and still run businesses? So the sponsor of this program is Herbal Results. And uh, most of the people who know me uh, know about Herbal Results and the company that I started in 2015 around health. And I can get very deep into that journey. And I think that that story would be very instructive for people as well. Um, as people start to roll in, uh, let me just tell you all what's going to happen is, is that uh, through the chats that are, uh, we're simultaneously live on Facebook, we're on Twitter, uh, which is now called X, and we are on uh, YouTube as well. And we'll be on more platforms as time goes on. Because these types of sessions are very important from all of the inboxes that I tend to get asking me, you know, multitude of questions. And what I know is, is that, you know, there are a lot of people who talk about business and business ideas, but when the rubber meets the road is based on people who've been successful in business and what that success looks like, what life looks like under a successful business and there's different ways to do it. And as people roll in, um, I'll just say that uh, one of the things that changed my life when it came to business was a book called The Four Hour Work Week. I will recommend this book up and down. I know that the book was written over a decade ago, so some of the information may be old, but the concepts are still the same and it is programmatic. It's not one of those, um, get rich quick books. It's not one of those books that's giving you a pep talk, like be all you can be and you're the greatest person in the world and you know, you're destined to be great. It's not that type of book. Um, it's a book that tells you step by step how to make money online. That's why it says the four hour work week. So you're doing about four hours of work. It's a book written by a guy named Tim Ferriss. And uh, I accidentally ran into the book. I was early for a meeting. It was in Washington, D.C., around probably 2007 or 2008. And um, I had a meeting uh, in Washington, D.C., but the meeting got moved back like two hours. So I was supposed to meet like at 1 o'clock, and it got moved to 3. So I had two hours to kill, and the place where I was meeting across the street was uh, a Borders book or Barnes and Nobles, I don't remember at the time. And um, I went to the book section, I went to the bestseller section, had the four hour work week. And what it had was it had palm trees and it had sand and it said the four hour work week. And it said bestseller teaches you how to basically do business in the internet age. And I found that to be very appealing. So first of all, just a little background on me is that um, I've always been a rebel. I've never saw myself as working for anybody, right? Um, there's a thing about uh, when I watched The Roots that really affected me in terms of another person thinking that they own you, right? Um, some people can watch Roots, you know, the series Roots uh, with Kunta Kinte and it'll affect them one way. Some people won't affect them. It affected me tremendously. And I saw, I saw slavery as like my number one pet peeve, uh, just philosophically, practically, that someone thought that they had more control over your life than you have. Something that really bothered me. 
And when I turned 16, I started working. My first job was for uh, Burger King. And when we worked at Burger King uh, at 16, I was making you know money that I never had before. And I was independent and all that. But I saw that one, um, there were single mothers. I was 16 at the time. So there was like 30 year old women, 40 year old women with three children working at Burger King. And they were making minimum wage. And at that time, minimum wage was like three dollars and 20 cents something like that it was like you know this was like in the in the 80s and um i didn't know how people could live on that that was money that i used to just buy school clothes right for the next you know school year and that was what i used my money for i was a teenager so i lived under my parents what have you but i got the taste of being independent and making money and ever since then i've never stopped making money and saw the utility of being independent and making money. However, working for other people showed me that other people really thought that they owned you and they owned your time. And uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of analysis about this when people talk about capitalism and capitalistic societies and what have you. Most people who talk about capitalism don't really even know what it is, right? They don't have a proper definition of capitalism, and it just becomes a catchword. Um, but you know, that's for another topic. But um, when I worked, I saw what the working environment was for adults. And um, I saw that it was not for me. Even though I was a very young, I wasn't even a man at the time. I was 18, 16, 17, 18. I'm looking at it and I'm saying, man, I can't, I just can't report to other people for the rest of my life. It feels like slavery to me. I just can't do it. And then I found out that the people that I was working for were not more intelligent than me. So that was like, that was like insult to injury. Like, I don't mind working for someone who knows more than me because that way I can learn from you. And then you've earned actually, you know, uh, something from someone who's my intellectual superior or at least experiential superior. But when I was working for these different places, I just saw that the people I was working for, I was working for, were not really like people who I looked up to intellectually. It's only been a very few times that I've actually had employment where the supervisor I found to be, you know, somebody that I could look up to intellectually, right? I feel like if I'm going to work for you and punch a clock, you need to be my intellectual superior. Right. And I'm not saying this in an arrogant way at all, but if I have to like correct your like I'm not talking about like spell check issues, like people who can't like really put words together and they use words wrong, they use the wrong, they don't people can't write letters and I have to take orders from you, it doesn't work out for me. And it never would and it never just it just never did. Now, that was coupled with the fact too that uh, I'm not a morning person. I am a night person. So that's probably my right brain because I'm also uh, an artist. I have creativity inside of me and I like to stay up all night when everyone is asleep. And I like to sleep when everyone is awake. So it became very clear to me that I had to be an entrepreneur and I had to put my own success or failure into my hands and I could not allow anybody to control whether I eat or not because they don't like me or they like me. It's a perilous place to put yourself in. And I saw this very early. Now, when I went to university, I was pre-med. And when I was pre-med, all of the science classes were in the morning. And I went to school in Boston. So in the wintertime, it's cold. It's like really cold. But all the classes were at 8.30 in the morning. They did it the chemistry classes, the biology classes, they did it to weed people out. They were very clear on that. And I saw this and I was like, it was like anathema to me. And how I got out of university with decent grades is beyond me. I don't know how I pulled it off, but I end up pulling it off. But I say to myself that I will never, once I'm a free man, in terms of don't have to go to school anymore, I'm never going to be in a situation where I have to wake up every morning because of somebody else's demands. And so an entrepreneur started becoming more 
and more um, realistic to me and who I needed to be. Now, here's the thing. Being an entrepreneur can be very perilous because you only eat what you kill. You understand what I'm saying? There is no safety net. There is no uh, backup plan. There is no, if your business works, it works. If it doesn't, you don't eat. So an entrepreneur is a risk taker. And I would say that the best time to take a risk is when you're young and you don't have heavy responsibilities like a wife and children and all of that. And it's just you and you have to take care of yourself. That's the time to explore. But it's also a time to lay good foundations in terms of the things that you've learned, things that you've trained. So my story is this, and we're going to get into we're going to get into online business and we're going to get into Africa business in the United States and Africa. And my online business is in the United States is what allows me to travel the world and live wherever I want, wake up whenever I want, do whatever I want. But there wasn't a time, there was a time when things weren't like this, y'all. There was a time that even my business became a shackle to me. And I'm going to get into all of that for you all. Um, so uh, my entrepreneurial life was as follows. I go to law school. Well, first of all, um, when I finished uh, university, I went to do a year working in the real world. So I worked um, for the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination uh, in Boston University at, at Boston in Boston, right? And uh, that was basically a job that was preparing me to go to law school. So basically, we would take discrimination cases like equal opportunity, employment cases, gender, race, and all of that. And so uh, I would take people's complaints and I'd be with the investigators and the lawyers. I end up going to uh, Northeastern University School of Law um, after my year from college because I, gr I graduated as pre-med with a degree in biopsychology and didn't want to do that because I didn't want to go to medical school anymore. So all of my professors told me, you should go to law school. So I end up doing that. I go to law school and in law school, um, I only went to law school not to be a lawyer, but I was actually intellectually curious about the law. So I went to law school really for one year. I did graduate and all that with flying colors, but I went to classes religiously for one year. The next two years I took off and just showed up for exams because I saw what the game was, right? And the game was, you know, when you go to law school, let me just tell y'all real quick, if y'all want to like, do a quick thing on law school and how to really pass through with flying colors with law school. All law school is, they don't teach you how to practice law, by the way. All law school is reading and analyzing appellate cases. That's all it is. That's all law school is, reading and analyzing appellate cases. So you get to find out what the problem area is or the subject matter is and what the conflict is and what the holding is. The holding is how the judges rule. And so once you understand that, that that's the format of law school, every single thing that you do in law school is reading legal cases and analyzing appellate cases. That's all you're doing. You don't really, unless you do mock trial, you don't even know which part of the courtroom you stand in. Uh, you're writing uh, analyses of law based on case law, previous cases. Now, one of the good things about law school is that it teaches you dialectical thinking. This has been very valuable for me. What do I mean by dialectical thinking? Dialectical thinking is the ability to think the thesis and the antithesis at the same time. So being able to understand um, the protagonist point of view and the antagonist point of view, right? Both sides point of view and understanding what their strongest arguments will be. So um, I go to law school for the first year, which they say is hard. Um, I didn't really find it hard because I had no problem reading books. I was a voracious reader. Um, and I, once I understood what it was about, it was easy to get through. And I was also with a group of brothers that we all connected with each other and we had, you know, support for each other. But, you know, law school was one of those types of things like, oh, wow, I'm in law school. I'm a first year law student. And let's just see what this is all about. Um, if you can handle reading, and you understand what they're asking you for, it's fine. Now, how I got over the hump in law school, and I got over the hump in a big way. What I mean by over the hump is the philosophical hump to understand what law school is really about, to be able to kind of really kill the exams. 
was is that once I understood that jurisprudence is about the desired outcome for your society based on the asili, which is what Marimba Ani calls the germinating root of a country. I understood the germinating root of America and what America was all about and what America says it was striving to be. So if you go to tort law, which is like accident law, you go to criminal law, you go to constitutional law, you go to contract law, you just have to understand what is the desired result that the custodians of this society would like to have. Um, and once you understand and put yourself in the minds of how they think society should run, a capitalistic society should run, um, you understand what um, you know insider trading is about, why they would pass a law for insider trading. You lose faith in the markets if other people got an advantage that other people don't have, even though they still do insider trading, a la Nancy Pelosi and crew. Um, they try to act like it's not because every society has its you know, little beacons of corruption, right? But you understand what they're trying to do in a society, and that's why you understand like antitrust, why you don't want one company to have a complete monopoly. Then it takes away competition, it takes away innovation, it takes away a lot of things. So once you understand the underpinnings of society and what is desired for the society, you can pass through law school with flying colors. Like you really can because you understand what it's all about. You understand what they want for the society, right? And you, you know, you can even get into the whole race issue and black folks. And because if you understand this country, black folks are people of African descent. Um, and you start reading the constitution and three fifths clause and you start understanding constitutional law, most constitutional law in America really is about how America is going to deal with black folks. That's really what most constitutional law is about. And you get strict scrutiny um, analysis and intermediate scrutiny and rational basis and all of that. That's a shout out to all my law people, but that makes you understand law school. So I get out of law school, yo, and I decide I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to, from Boston, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Miami. I'm going to take the Florida bar exam because why? I want to go where mangoes grow. Like people will laugh, but that's the truth. Like if I'm gonna live somewhere in America, if I'm gonna be in America, I need to live in a tropical place. Why am I gonna take a bar exam in New York? Why am I gonna take it in Washington, DC? Why am I gonna take it anywhere where it's not warm and tropical? I'm from Africa, like really, like I'm from Africa in the sense of like, um, I was born there. And my memory when I was like three years old was being stuck in a mango tree as a child in Ghana. Like, I remember that. So I'm saying to myself, like, yo, I need to get back, you know, to some type of continental vibes as close as I can in America. And that would be Florida because it's subtropics and mangoes grow there. So that's why I actually moved to Florida. Me and a couple other brothers moved down. Everyone studied for the bar exam. Now, with the bar exam, I was pissed off because... Here we are, we graduated from law school. We took all the exams to graduate third year of law school. And now we got to go take another exam and pay for it. And then some people would take a loan to study for the, for the bar exam. It's like, damn, like, when does this stop? So when I had to take the bar exam, um, I studied at night. So all the brothers that I was hanging out with, they took the Kaplan courses and I would take their books at night and I would study. I was busy living in South Beach chasing Brazilian chicks on the beach. That's what I was doing because I was like, yo, this is not like, you understand? I'm, I'm trying to live life and these people are putting us through exam after exam after exam and make us pay and making us pay. And I'm like, yo, if I, if I take the bar, I'm going to take it once because I didn't really even want to be a lawyer, y'all. I just went to law school because I was told by my professors that, you know, that would be something good for you to do because you speak well and you do well in debates and what have you. Reading ain't nothing for you and you care about like our people so we could use people like you to be advocates. So I said, fine, I'll do it because I didn't want to go to medical school anymore. All right. So I ended up taking the bar exam. I passed the bar exam. The problem is your boy only got about $50 in his bank account at this time. This is real talk. This is 1998. Um, graduate law school in May, take the bar exam in like August or something like that. By that time, I only got like 50 bucks.
think the mic got muted. I think y'all can hear me now. Anyway, I got a message that, um, you know, there's a lawyer in Florida who's got extra office space. I go check him out, William Ferguson, big up William Ferguson. I check him out and um, he offers me office space because one of the lawyers, it was in Opalaka, Florida. Anyone who knows about Miami, you know about Opalaka, that's the hood. Big up William Ferguson. He turned a house into a law office and um, there were other lawyers practicing there. One of the lawyers became a judge, so that space freed up. William Ferguson saw me, he was like, man, I like you, but we got to get you a suit, man. Like you, <laughs> like you come in here busted up. <laughs> like I like you. So he walked me into his like bedroom where in the back where he had different suits. He said, man, I gained too much weight. Here's a suit. So he gave me a suit. So I had this one nice suit and I started practicing law. Now, here's the thing. Remember, I did not want to be a lawyer, so I did not apply for any jobs with any law firms or anything. And I didn't want to work for anybody. But at the time, only had like 50 bucks on me. And I'm like, yo, I got to do something at this point. And this just fell into my lap. And so now he gives me this probate case. He says, listen, I've been sitting on this case for two years. I'm going to give you this case. This is a big estate. You get 3%. You just split it in half with me but you do all the work. I was like, cool, I'll do it. Well, anyway, um, during that time, I start doing different legal cases. People start walking into the office. In the community now, people are starting to get to know me because I'm part of the, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm engaged with the uh, activist community, like the black activist community, because that's the type of time I'm on. I'm a Pan-Africanist. So any type of Pan-Africanist activity, I'm gonna be involved. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm new to the place, but I'm finding out who's who, who's doing what. Um, at the same time, when I'm in law school, we start a reggae band. We don't know how to play nothing. We don't know how to nothing, but I know how to write and I know how to write songs. And I, you know, and so because I left my band, even though we didn't play well, none of us really knew music, but we were just doing it to do it. Something to do while I was in law school. So I turned all of my songs into poetry. And at that time, this is 1998. Love Jones was big. Poetry is big. And it's like, there's an open mic spot everywhere. So I start doing my songs as poetry. And like, people tell me I'm really good. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Like really good to the point where people are willing to like pay to see me where I'm invited to go to universities and perform and talk my shit. Like talk about Pan-African, talk about this, talk about Africa, talk about, you understand what I'm saying? And I'm doing it in poetic form and I'm getting booked from one college to the next. And I'm starting to make money as a poet, almost equal to what I'm doing as a lawyer. And I'm like, yo, I'd rather, I'd rather do this. And I never ever had planned to become a poet. So many people who know me throughout the years know me as Poet Heru or Heru the Poet, because I never used my last name, right? Only recently have people known me as Heru Ofori Ata, like, you know what I'm saying? Um, the entrepreneur herbal results, you know, Bitcoin, all those type of things. But for between 2000 and I'd say probably 2010, people only just knew me as Heru the Poet. That's just how I was known. And because that's what I did professionally. So um, I that's how I got a window into celebrity and how you don't want to be a celebrity because of some of the things I had to deal with because I was like a mini celebrity in certain circles because of my poetry. Now I was now here's the thing while i was practicing law again i'm working for myself um i see the perils of being a lawyer because an independent lawyer because what's happening is i'm known as a lawyer for the community and anytime people are in trouble they're coming to me for all types of legal issues and you know because i'm known as part of the activist community you know, people are expecting me to take their cases and they're not paying me back. So even to this day, I got about $50,000 on the streets in Miami that's owed to me that I'll never get back because I did legal cases for people. Never People never paid me back because everyone was looking for the hookup. And I was the type of cat. I show up at the courthouse and I would see people with really simple cases at the courthouse, but they didn't have $2,500 for their lawyer that day. So the lawyer never showed up. So they'd be there crying and they would see me in a suit and they'd be like, are you a lawyer? Can you help us out? And I would like, because my heart was like, yo, 
like let's let's do this you know what i'm saying i'm for the people so i'm not gonna let money get in the way yeah i'll represent you so i'm representing people and they're not paying me all right but remember i got this probate case that's like several million dollars a state that i get three percent of if i'm able to take care of this probate and newsflash for those who practice law if you want to practice law you go to the law clerks at the courthouse they know all the paperwork you need to file they know the judges you need to talk to they know everything you ain't got to do like as a lawyer you don't really need to know how to practice law if you're not doing a trial what you do is you befriend a, a, a clerk of the courts you go to the clerk of the courts you befriend them and they will tell you every single thing that you need to file in terms of paperwork that's why most lawyers don't know uh they say you can't hear can you all can you all hear me let me know if you can hear me you can't hear me let me see Let's see what we could do in terms of the gain can you all hear me okay you can hear me okay sound is good okay everyone can hear me all right so you heard everything i was saying so the clerk of the courts they're the ones who manage what's happening in the court system and so a lot of times the clerk of the courts are usually black women at least in miami they're they're the clerks they're the ones like the clerk for the judges or the court system or whatever and they see a young brother in a suit coming in and he's brand new they're eager to help and so i just dealt with them and they were just like they were they were lining me up good they were like do this paperwork do that paperwork do this. and that's how i learned how to practice law big up the clerks the sisters who were the clerks of the court because they looked out for your brother i didn't know anything in terms of practicing law and they showed me exactly what to file what to do and all that okay so meantime between time um i'm doing private practice i'm seeing how this legal thing goes and literally there's lawyers working in the same office as me and i'm seeing like people come in with bags of money like 20,000 here because there's one <laughs> there's a cat named Joseph Tessman he's a um he's a, he's a, a Caucasian dude lawyer and he did criminal law and um like he did all types of criminal cases and people used to just come in with like literally the plastic bags and lunch bags full of money cash and these were like drug dealers you know what i'm saying and i've seen how he's like clearing ten thousand in a couple hours from people walking in he's passing me his cases he doesn't want and so this thing is this thing is happening y'all and i'm seeing how lawyers are making money i'm seeing the hustle and it has nothing to do with truth it has nothing to do with justice it has nothing to do with nothing and so i'm going to court a lot of times judges have seen me because they've never seen me before they think i'm the defendant right but i'm like no nah, i'm actually counsel you know what i'm saying and and it's like it's crazy it's just absolutely crazy anyway and it was crazy because i i took the bar exam one time and i said if i don't pass this thing i'm not going to take it again i'm not going to take it again because i don't care about this thing and that's actually why i passed the exam because when i took the bar exam listen when you take the bar exam it was in a big amphitheater like a gymnasium in Tampa. You take it in Florida, it was in Tampa, a big ass amphitheater. And there's thousands of law students there. And when you take the plane, so I had to take a plane from Miami to Tampa and we're on there and everyone going to Tampa, then most of the people were law students going to take the bar exam. Check this out. People are crying because if they don't pass this bar exam, the offer of the job that they're working is rescinded. You understand what I'm saying? Is rescinded. They don't like their hundred thousand dollar job that they got. They don't have it anymore if they don't pass this bar exam. Sitting next to me on the plane, I'm talking about people with families, and some people are taking the bar exam for the third time. You understand what I'm saying? So that they can try to get a job, and it's like, yo, this is like high stakes. And I'm sitting on the plane like, whatever. I'm vexed because I'm like, yo, I don't even want to take this exam. This is a scam. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, I show up to the bar exam. I'm going in there with spite. You could tell people are intimidated. I'm sitting next to people. 
listen, I'm the bar exam starts is for six hours for two days. You have a three hour session, lunch, three hour session, day one, then a day two, three hour session, lunch, and then a three hour session. So you basically take an exam for 12 hours over two days, right? So the first three hours I get in there, they have the table, they have your seat assignment and all that. The dude next to me starts vomiting. He starts vomiting. He can't take the pressure. He's just vomiting. And he 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 gets it has to get taken out of there. Like literally, this dude's vomiting by my feet. He can't take the pressure. And I'm just vexed. I'm like, let me get out of this blood clot. You know what I'm saying? So I just start taking the exam, taking the exam, but I'm taking it out of spite. I'm like, yo, y'all are just like, y'all are just wicked ass people trying to make people do exam after exam after exam after exam after exam. And I'm like, yo, I'm coming with an attitude. So anyway. I take the exam, um, and that's actually how I learned about this agricultural exemption, y'all, that I'm doing right now with the um, mango farm. Because one of the questions was, you know, uh, someone like has an like an animal on his property, and da da da. da what what are the property consequences? Basically, he gets an agricultural exemption. I saw this in homestead in the backyard of somebody who had like a horse or a cow. And I'm like, what's this dude doing with one cow in his backyard? And then I, when I was looking at property laws, like, yo, he's doing it because he has one cow in his backyard because he's getting an agriculture exemption where he doesn't have to pay property taxes. This guy's a clever dude. And I remembered that. And that was one of the questions on the bar exam, right? So, so, so I remembered that. But anyway, so what they do with the bar exam is like after a couple of weeks, they post up your scores with an anonymous number. So they'll send you piece of mail with what your like code number is and you go on their website look at your number my number said passed and I passed very well to the point where I actually was able to um what they call it uh I was able to qualify for the bar to be part of the bar of like Washington DC New Jersey a couple other places if I wanted to because my score was so high right but that's just a lesson in not being scared of these people you understand what I'm saying because I learned very early, like I took it to heart when I started reading Tony Browder's book, African Origin of Civilization and how Africans, you know, are responsible for mathematics and, you know, um, construction and science and all of that. So I was like, yo, I had a chip on my shoulder. I had a real chip on my shoulder. So I'm like, yo, and my theme song when I was in um, law school in the end of my career at university when I was pre-med, before I went to exams, I always played a Bob Marley song called Stiff Naked Fools. Stiff Naked Fools, you think you are cool to deny me for simplicity. Y'all listen to the song when you get a chance. Maybe I'll play it at the end of this thing, you know, but they always block it because Facebook be player hating. But it's, that's a whole nother story. But I would take, I would listen to these songs and it would fuel me. So every time I had to perform academically, I had a chip on my shoulder. I was mad, arrogant, like y'all can't defeat me with this. And that's the attitude you should be giving your children, by the way, that they shouldn't be intimidated by any academic pursuits at all. They should go in there with an attitude. Like, why are you even testing me? That was my, my, that was my thing. Like I graduated from your law schools with flying colors. Why are you giving me a bar exam? Anyway, I'm doing this law office thing. I'm hustling here and there. People ain't paying me, but I'm still taking cases. And I'm like, one day I'm just like, yo, let me see what's up. Cause I, I was interested in like corporate, um, like international law. I was interested in that. So I end up working, I end up seeing a um, ad for looking for a young attorney, you know, who wants to do international law, um, international business law. And I called them and um, it was King International Manufacturing Group. They basically hired factories in China to uh, make forklifts and heavy equipment that he would then resell in the United States under his brand, the owner of the company. The owner of the company is looking for a young lawyer to basically deal with all the legal stuff. I'm like, you know what? China is get coming up. I need to learn how to do business in China. So this might be interesting. But I say to him, so I go and I say to him, look, I'm not your like regular nine to five guy. Also, 
I got a private practice. He said, don't worry. You can use our office as a private practice. He said that. I said, I'm in. You understand what I'm saying? I can learn about. And, and so this guy, he's a Jewish guy, really from Poland, but his his family left, I think, World War II and all the things that was happening against the Jews then. And they went to like South America and they went to Paraguay or Uruguay. One of them guys, it's either Paraguay or Uruguay. And so the guy spoke fluent Spanish, but he took a liking to me. And I saw how the Jewish community supports each other in terms of money. His main benefactor and the main investor, investor in his private company was this Jewish guy named Royal Jonas, who owns a bank in Miami. The dude owned a bank. So whenever this guy needed money, he would loan him money. And that's how they got, that's how they did their thing. Like, there were times where this guy wasn't selling anything and having pro and Roy Jonas and Roy Jonas would come to the uh, office and dude would come in shorts, sandals, and he would drive like a, a old like Datsun. And the guy was a billionaire. He owned a bank in Miami in South Beach. It's called the something bank. I forget the name of the bank. So I'm seeing how these guys get down. But this guy, for some reason, the owner of the company takes a liking to me. And he starts showing me the whole playbook on how they do business and also how to do business in China. It got so crazy that I became a chief legal counsel of the company. And then he also made me the COO of the company. This is crazy, y'all. He made me the COO, the chief operating officer. So now I was laying down policy and rules for all the other employees on how they do business when they come to the office. Like, do this first and do this. This is how you do this. And then I'm also negotiating deals with the Chinese. And this was very, very, very enlightening for me in terms of business. The reason why I'm telling this story is I want to be very thorough to let you all understand my business history and why I've been able to be successful in business. And it started very early by having certain mentors, right? So check this out. The Chinese are 12 hours ahead. So you've got to like deal with them at, at night, but when you're at work, you, so you got to deal with them with email a lot. So when you send email, by the time you get to work in the morning, they've already responded. And check this out. The Chinese wrote English better than Americans that I was sending emails to. I mean, their English was perfect. You understand what I'm saying? Their English was perfect. No, did they need minority representation? No, they did. the dude just liked me. He just liked me for whatever reason. He just, I must have said the right things to him. And I guess I didn't come in thirsty because I told him, Lift, listen, if I'm going to work for this company, I need to be able to run my own thing, too, because I have a private legal practice. And he was like, yeah. So I think he respected that. And I think also there was a time when he was late with payments. No, there was a time when he overpaid me because his wife did the accounting and I returned the check to him and said, it was too much money. It was against our agreement. She ended up paying me more than she was supposed to. And he was flabbergasted. He never saw anybody be honest like that and return money. Because I was making money on the side, doing my own thing. You understand? So I've always been making money. But I wasn't thirsty that I was going to take a couple hundred extra dollars. That, and for him, I remember going to him with the check and say, yo, she overpaid me. He couldn't even understand what I was saying because he didn't understand that anyone would come to him to tell him that they were being overpaid. He literally got tears in his eyes that day. And I think that's when he really, really was like, yo, I want to deal with this dude, right? So anyway, um, the Chinese are very shrewd and they're not playing around. And I got to find out like how amazing they are in terms of manufacturing, man my hat's off to the Chinese. And that's why when I talk about Africa, I talk about Africa from a very serious point because I understand what the Chinese went through and what the Chinese did and what the Chinese had to do to become the superpower that they are today. Remember, the Chinese lost the opium wars to the British. And the opium wars was not about opium. If anybody wants to know about the opium wars and wants story time on the opium wars, let me know and I'll give you a quick story. So I'm going to take a few seconds. Text right in the comments. Do you want to hear story time on the opium wars? If not, I can move on. Let me know. 
I'm gonna wait a second. Anybody want to hear story time on the Opium Wars? If you don't, I'll continue with the story. Okay, you want to hear about the Opium Wars? All right, check this out. All right, here's what you need to know about the Opium Wars. The Opium Wars was not about opium, y'all. What was happening was in the 1800s, um, remember that most of European most of European exploration, and the Opium Wars is going to tell you a lot about China, by the way, to understand China. So check this out. Um, most of the travel that has happened in terms of exploration from Europeans has been based on addictions. The addiction to oil, the addiction to, to, to different things, but they were looking for spices, right? That's what you heard about Columbus trying to sail to India. That's why the whole Caribbean's called the West Indies because he thought he was in India, right? And you know, if Columbus thought he was in Poland, the whole Caribbean would be called West Polish, by the way. You know what I'm saying? So Jamaicans would be called West Polish, but because he thought he was in India, it's called West Indian, right? But anyway, that's besides the point. So when the Europeans got to China, they discovered tea. Tea. Tea is a big thing in China. And so they brought that back. And the bourgeoisie are the ones who always get the first line of imports right these are the wealthy people they always get the imports from other countries they get they get it first so the royal families of england and all of that and that's an interesting story too y'all ever want to hear about the royal family of england they're really germans but if you want to hear about that we can talk about that too because i look deeply into them because i need to understand why one little island country has basically controlled most of the world where everyone speaks their language, one little island country. This is something that has to be interrogated. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying how Britain pulled it off. That I'm speaking their language to y'all right now. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, um, they start getting tea and it becomes something that the bourgeoisie, aristocracy, royalty is dealing with on a serious level to the point where the poor people start getting tea as well. And that's why, like today in London and in Great Britain, they have tea time, right? Can I have some tea, please? You know, the, the accent that they have. So, anyway, um, they are exchanging tea for gold. So, what happens is, is that when they get tea from the Chinese, they have to exchange gold. The, the Chinese are taking gold in exchange for tea. Well, the Chinese are like, yeah, just, you know, we'll, we'll sell you our tea. Give, keep giving us your gold. The British start having a meeting amongst the lords and the chancery courts and all that. Like, yo, we can't keep giving these people gold. We're going to start running out of gold. The problem is your whole society is addicted to tea. It's become a part of their culture to the point that if you take the tea away from them, they're literally going to riot. Do you remember the United States, the Boston Tea Party, right? Look how all this comes together. Remember the United States is just a colony of Britain. It's just little Britain. That's why you have New England. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? New England, right? So check this out. I mean, New York was called New Amsterdam. Like, I mean, it, it, look, so here's the thing. These people are saying, yo, we're running out of gold, y'all. This is the British. But we can't stop getting tea or else if we stop tea, it's going to change the fabric of life for not just us, the nobility, but also the average person. It's going to cause riots in the streets. Okay. And we're going to get into the kind of tea they were sipping on and you're going to freak out when I, when I, when I tell you because things are going to start to come together. Um, so the, the, the British meet and they say, listen, we're running out of gold. We got to go to the Chinese and tell the Chinese, we got to do something. We got to change the terms and we're willing to trade them anything else except gold. So the, so the British meet with the Chinese, right? 
they have a big meeting with the Chinese and the Chinese guys are there and the British guys are there and the Chinese say, yeah, what do you need? Like, what's up? Why do you want to meet? British say, well, you know, we've been doing good business with you guys with the whole tea trade and everything, but um, we just want to change a couple things. Uh, we still want your tea. Don't get ready. We still want you. Don't don't get don't don't get excited too much. We still want your tea, um, but we just don't want to trade you gold for tea. Uh, so we are going to to offer. Anything that we have that you want, we'll trade for your tea. We'll just work out the prices and all of that, but we'll exchange it for your tea. Anything else but gold. So anything that you want, you know, we'll we'll, we'll barter that. The Chinese go in caucus for about five minutes, and they come back and they say to the British, "Um, we've met as Chinamen, and we've talked, and um, unfortunately, there's nothing that you have that we want." <laughs> That's what the Chinese tell them. And you want to be in that position. You want to be able to sit across from people and say, there's nothing that you have that we want. You understand? There's nothing that you have that we want. There's nothing. The Chinese said, no, we don't even want your women. We, there's nothing that you have that we want. So run that goal. And the British are shocked because they've never been told this before. Everyone else wants whatever the British got because you know there's such a, 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 a such a great monarchy and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And the Chinese ain't even phased by nothing they have. And the Chinese said, there's nothing that you, they literally tell them that. There's nothing that you have that we want. And this, I always remember this as Africans, that we have to at some point get to that where people can come to us and we can say to them, there's nothing that you have that we want and mean that. So the British now say, um, what do you mean there's nothing that we have that you want? Surely there's something the Chinese don't even blink. They said, no, gold, run the gold. That's it. That's the only thing you have that we want. Nothing else. There's nothing else that you want. There's nothing else that you have that we want. The British are shocked and they're offended. So here's what the British decide to do. They say, okay, so they still keep the gold payments going. Then the British decide, ooh, the Chinese used to have a problem with opium. And the law was because opium, people got addicted so much. It's just basically the form of heroin that people were getting addicted and it took the productivity of the country down. So the law in China was if you got caught with opium, it was a death penalty because you're messing up the progress of the country. They're not playing around with you. They're not negotiating with you. There's not like a million appeals. You get caught with opium, you die, period. All right. So what the British start to do, their plan is we're going to smuggle in opium into China in exchange for gold with the black market and get our gold back by selling opium and then ruining their country through drugs. Uh, anybody know about the CIA and Rick Ross and what they did to black America? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Get money from the poor black folks in exchange for cocaine, ruin their society with crack, and then take the money to fund whatever we want. This is what, this is the playbook. All right. All right. The Chinese one day find a British boat off the coast of Hong Kong and they seize the boat. On the boat, they find the boat is full of opium. They take the boat, they seize it, and they burn it. The British, listen to this, respond and say, that was an act of war. You took British property and you burned it. It's an act of war. Now, the British took that approach because they knew that the Chinese did not focus on building a navy. So the British knew that they could have the upper hand in terms of naval warfare. 
So imagine someone seizes a boat full of contraband that you're trying to pump into their country and you call that an act of war. That's the hubris that you're dealing with. But this is what people can do to you when they have more military power than you. So what happens? The opium wars start. That's what they call the opium wars. Because the Chinese seized a boat full of opium that was illegal in their country, that gave people the death penalty in their country, but the British saw that as an act of war. So they initiated warfare and the British end up winning the naval warfare during the opium wars, which gives them Hong Kong for about a hundred years under lease, which they returned back to the Chinese like in 2000. So now Hong Kong, the people in the Chinese in Hong Kong now have an identity conflict with mainland China because you meet people in Hong Kong who is named like, uh, like with British names, like Billy Wong. You understand what I'm saying? Christine Wong, because they've been anglicized. And not only that, they now have the Christian religion. So that's a problem now too, because now the people of Hong Kong culturally are feeling more British than they're feeling Chinese, even though they still speak Chinese and they're Chinese people, but because Britain took over Hong Kong and they took over Hong Kong because Hong Kong is a port city. So it's strategic and they had it for over a hundred years and they only gave it back to the Chinese recently. And it's causing big problems in terms of mainland China and Hong Kong. But this is what the opium wars was about. So the Chinese never forgot. And they said, we lost. And during that period, they actually call that the period of shame or the period of embarrassment. It was national embarrassment because they could not control their own destiny. Japan was taken over and instituting slavery on the Chinese mainland. Like the Japanese and the Chinese traditionally don't like each other because Japan was always a military power greater than China. This is, this is very deep, y'all. If you understand world politics and understand what's been happening in the world before we were born, it's very important. But anyway, the Chinese never forgot this. And they, they said they used first principles thinking. Why were the British able to do what they were able to do with us? Because they had more military might. Why did they have more military might? Because they manufactured their own boats and manufactured their own weapons. They manufactured. So the Chinese said, hmm, seems that manufacturing is the key to freedom and the, free to live, and the key to sovereignty. So what did China do? They said, we're going to close down everything. We're not doing anything. We're going to have a little cultural revolution just to get the culture thing straight. Right. That was Mao Zedong and all of that. We need a cultural, you know, new framework of mind and to understand that we're going to have to become manufacturers. We're going to have to manufacture every single thing that we need. And China did that. And within 50 years, China became the manufacturing center of the world where it loans the world money now because everyone is buying their products. Remember, the Japanese decided to become the center for electronics in the world after world war ii and they got bombed to oblivion twice by nuclear weapons yes the atomic bomb was nuclear weapons the united states used nuclear weapons the only country to ever use nuclear weapons in japan and japan said okay we're going to have to deal with power on a serious level and so when we people of african descent want to start talking people that's why i don't really i can't really talk in certain circles because people don't understand that um, you're not going to march your way into power. You're not going to legislate your way into power. You're not going to shame people into power. You're not even going to reparations your way into power. You're going to manufacture your way into power. You have to manufacture every single thing that you need. And the people who take care of manufacturing are the businessmen and the businesswomen. And that's why I became a businessman, because I understood that I couldn't do it with my strong poetry. No matter how great it was, I'm going to have to become a businessman. That comes later in the story, but I just took a little reroute to deal with the opium wars to just give you all a little history to understand my mind and my framework and why I approach the world the way I approach the world. Okay, so now y'all give a little, y'all got a little insight. So when I say certain things that I say, you understand where I'm coming from. It's not that I'm not down with any of the things that people are talking about, but emotionalism doesn't get you anywhere. Manufacturing does. 
right? You can march, you can do whatever. You're not going to get a fair shake in this world unless you have the independence to make everything that you need. If you need it from other people, those people will control your destiny. And that's just the way the world works. The law of the jungle is whoever runs the, whoever is more powerful runs the jungle and it doesn't change. That's why, you know, if people want to talk to me about reparations, I don't waste my time on that. Yes, morally, black folks all over the world are due reparations. Yes. But for you to receive reparations would mean that you would change the natural order of what victory means in a war. You see, um, what you're trying to do is, is that you've lost a war as a people and you're looking for concessions for the losers instead of spending your time doing what's necessary to be a winner. That's why I don't deal with the reparations talk because we're looking for concessions for our people who lost a conflict because slavery was not even slavery, what people are calling it. In terms of international law, we were prisoners of war. People come in, snatch you up, put you in chains. We were prisoners of war. To be a slave was a prisoner of war. And so you have, you're born into a prisoner of war status. And that's why they could do the fugitive slave laws and all that type of, type of stuff. But that's a whole different talk that we could have for another day, but it's just a different way to calibrate thinking. When you lose a war, you only have two choices. Either you are going to be the loser or you're going to try to find a way to win. But if we're not focused on what's necessary to win, all we have is conversations about getting concessions for losers, for people who've lost. And the jungle don't work like that, y'all. The jungle does not work like that. We are two... I think we're about two chromosomes removed from primates. Go watch how chimpanzees organize their society and ask if it's fair. It's not fair. Warfare and losing a war has huge consequences. And so it is very incumbent upon a group of people who've lost a war because that's what we were. We're prisoners of war to understand that you're going to have to get real power to change your relationship with those who were your wardens. That's all it was. We're, and, and it's not just for black folks in America, black folks in the, black folks on the continent. We're prisoners of war when it comes to colonization. So it's like no one's better than anybody. We're all prisoners, we're all prisoners of war. We're all still speaking the colonial language. I speak English, I was born in Ghana, you speak English, you were born in New York, but we black the same way. So that means that we got the same warden under prisoner of war status. And so the question is, is that these people like what the Chinese, what happened with the Chinese, what are you gonna do? You're gonna protest, you're gonna write letters to the United Nations about what happened to you during the opium wars, or are you just gonna actually do what's necessary to manufacture your way out of this? where you end up buying all the property and loaning money to your former adversary. And that's what the Chinese did. And the Chinese have a long memory. They do not forget. They have a 300 year horizon plan. They're not playing with you and do not play with them. If you are in China and you get convicted of bribery as a government official, do you know what they do? They real quick court case, they sentence you to death, but before you get sentenced to death, they don't even tell you the day you're going to die. How do you know when you're going to die in China when you're a government official who died of taking bribe, who, who was convicted of taking bribes? You start hearing, brum, 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 brum. and what is that? Those are ambulances coming. Why are the ambulances coming when you've been sentenced to death? That's the day you know you're going to die. Why? Because the ambulances have come to harvest your organs. That's what they do in China for people who've been convicted of corruption. They harvest your organs because they're saying that you are useless to the state, but maybe your organs will be useful to other people. So they take your organs while they kill you in China. That's when you know you're dying. They don't give you the day when you're gonna die. You know you're gonna die when you hear as a corrupt official in China. Now, those of us who come from Caribbean country to African countries, we might wanna start thinking about how we can institute those type of things. Because corruption is what's affecting our GDP and, our, and, and, and really the quality of life 
for people in these so-called underdeveloped countries where we have all the minerals in the world, but you have a wealthy class that's stealing from everybody. Look at Mobutu Sese Seiko. We can start talking about these things. This is why I'm having these lies because I need y'all to understand what's been going on in the world and why I have the worldview that I have. And I get all these inboxes all the time. And it's hard for me to answer your question with yes or no without giving you the context as to why I'm saying what I'm saying. And I get you know, 50, 60 inboxes in different places all the time, people asking me for advice. So that's why I started doing these lives. And I want to break it down so people understand where I'm coming from. All right. So I'm doing business with China now, working for this um, Jewish dude. This is around 1999, 2000, 2001, y'all. And so I'm watching how these Chinese do business. They're very shrewd. And as a matter of fact, there's a guy in China right now that if I see him, we got to square up. I definitely got to catch a fade with this dude called Fan Dong Ming because he was talking a lot of smack. And this is from 20 years ago. But I just like the Chinese, I have a long ass memory. And if I if I see Fan Dong Ming, he, he owes me a fade because we used to do business and he started talking smack and he didn't deliver what he was supposed to deliver. But anyway, I learned that the Chinese, they speak English better than people in America. They write English better than people in America. And they're very shrewd. And they, they set the terms because they are the manufacturers of the world. So Jewish businessmen, Christian businessmen, Muslim businessmen, I don't care what religion you are. You got to go to China if you're trying to build anything of any real seriousness. Your Apple iPhone is made in China, y'all. They graduate the engineers to be able to pull this off. And they, they were very methodical about it. Now, they've made some mistakes with the one-child policy. They're going to have a demographic collapse. That's a whole nother thing. China's in for a demographic collapse. Japan is in for a demographic collapse. America's in for a demographic collapse. Western Europe is in for a demographic collapse because the birth rate is way under the death rate. The re it's called the replacement rate. It's actually negative replacement rate. And so within two, three generations, you, you're not going to have actually a society in these places. They made a mistake with their one child policy because they were trying to increase the rate of growth, but lower the population expansion. So there's some things that they had to deal with in the Japanese right now because of technological, the, the way that they do technology, um, the children have grown up with technology where they prefer technological relationships um, over real human relationships. You start to see it in America where people have online relationships more than they have real relationships. And so the Japanese youth now are prepare, are, prepare, are uh, they're preferring having like virtual online dating with like avatars in people who aren't real than actually dating the, the, the girls, dating the boys. Like they're saying there's no point in dating, like what's the upside? But what happens is as long as you keep the sperm away from the egg, you don't have a new generation. And so Japan is actually facing a demographic catastrophe. China is facing demographic catastrophe because what happened with the one child policy was when uh, husband and wife were expecting a girl, they literally killed the girl babies because the boys were gonna be the earners to be able to take care of the parents when they were old. So they preferred the boys over the girls because of the earning capacity and capability of the boy over the girl. So they killed the girls. So now they've got a surplus of boys and not enough girls. And that's why they're sending Chinese men all over the world to go work and do projects. Because in Ghana right now, you've got like half Chinese babies right now in Ghana because the Chinese workers who are doing like illegal gold mining or whatever they're doing in China, they hooking up with Ama and Akuswa. You understand what I'm saying? And now you got like, you know what I'm saying? You got like, uh, 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 like Mei Ling Ama, like Mei, you know what I mean? Like Mei Ling Dankwa. You know what I'm saying? You got like Chinese first names and Ghanaian last names or Chinese last names and Ghanaian first names. This is what's going on. This is real because there aren't enough women for like 20 year old Chinese men because of what happened. They didn't think that part out that this is what was going to happen. And they didn't enforce like killing girls. Like that's crazy. But this is the situation that they're dealing with. 
And we got our own problems, but I just want to just kind of lay out what's happening in the world that's not spoken about. In the United States, you're seeing the same demographic problems where Black women are having less children than their mothers and less children than their grandmothers, and it's being less, less um, children because of some things that are happening. And so there's some things that's hap that, that need to be addressed, which I don't think is going to be addressed in, a, in American society because it's based on rugged individualism. We can have a whole life on demographic collapse and what are the ingredients of demographic collapse. And if you start seeing it in your family, you might want to start. This is why we go to Africa. This is why, you know, Africa should always be an option for you because it's different cultural values. It's not based on rugged individualism. Individualism is based on Ubuntu. You know, I am because we are. And so the needs and the desires of the group is much more important than the needs and the desires of the individual. Whereas in America, the needs of the individual reign supreme. So it's all about the individual. And when you have individualism reign supreme, then you start getting loneliness, anxiety, no family structures, neighbors don't know each other. It's all about me, 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 me. And this is a problem. You start getting that in society and you start seeing low birth rates. You start seeing no value for family. People are more interested in their professions more than they are their families. They're, they, they, you know, being a wife and a mother or being a husband and a father is no more important. It's not important anymore in a rugged individualistic society. But anyway, um, Africa is the future. Like it, it is what it is. And if you want to get away from that, Africa is there for you because that that is firm in African societies. And actually, Sheikh Anta Diop has it in a book um, called um, The African Origin of Civilization. And also um, there's another book called um, The Cultural Unity of Black Africa. He talks about the two cradle civilization theory. You have the Northern cradle and the Southern cradle, Southern cradle, and what those characteristics are is about like Ubuntu, it's about like family, it's about um, continuity, it's about reverence of elders, ancestors, that, whereas Northern civilization is more about like individual rights and individualism and all of that, and like individual property, whereas like Southern civilization is more about like group owned property. It's a, it's a whole different thing. And that's because of environmental factors right if you're living in a cold place an extra mouth to feed in the form of a child is actually seen as a burden because you ain't got fruit trees you ain't got you ain't got a you know you 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 gotta hunt you gotta run for your food you know you don't have trees like that grow all year round you can't do really serious farming in a non-tropical place that's why i'm telling my people like if you're gonna like live anywhere in america try to try to live in florida like I'm trying to keep it real. Like if you're living in Atlanta, Georgia, you might as well just move to Florida. If you ain't gonna go to Africa or the Caribbean, the reason is number one, the weather's better. It's better for you as a tropical person because all black folks, we're tropical people. Like, let's forget about the whole, I'm native American, I'm African, whatever. we're tropical people. Like you are somebody who needs to be close to the equator because of your skin and vitamin D and health reasons and emotional psychological reasons that have to do with circadian rhythm and have to do with vitamin D and, and, and all of that. But on a practical level, Florida doesn't have um, income taxes, state income taxes. So why the hell would you live in Georgia over Florida if you don't have to? You're paying 15% more of your income to live in Georgia or South Carolina or any of these other states just by being there. Just by being present, you're being taxed 15% more to live in a colder environment. So to me, that don't make even that doesn't make any sense. If you can work online and if you can do an online business, and if you just got to live in America, Florida is one of the best places to live. I'm telling y'all that right now. You have a beach, you have like you, you, you have like 80 degree weather almost every day. You know, with online with Online is equalized everything. You can live anywhere in the world now. Like, and there's even people who don't have their own businesses online and just do remote work. You understand know what I'm saying? Yeah, the storms. The, yeah, the storms. But you know, if you if you are worried about the storms, you know, you just leave for a little bit for that day or two. But the storms don't hit like West Palm Beach every year. It doesn't. It's not like so frequent. But you've got. 99% of the time, the weather is beautiful. You'll get a hurricane every now and then. And even if it happens, it's not, it's not going to hit your city. It might hit another city. And if it does hit your city, you just hunker down, you clean up. We've seen it. But 
uh, online business allows you to travel to different places of the world. And for me, I'm just at the point in my life now that I can't, like, I'm not going to live in cold weather. To me, that's uncivilized. I'm not doing it and I'm not going to pay extra to live in cold weather. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I grew up in Chicago. Like, I, I've done that. You know, I know it very well. I went to school in Boston. Like, I know 12 inches of snow overnight and having to shovel it. Like, I, I know it. And now we ain't doing that. So, for me, it's all about Africa more than even politically. It's just way of life. And so when you set up your life to be able to be able to live anywhere in the world, this is very important. And this when this is what I'm going to talk about. So that and none of this is theory. This is what I was able to do for myself. So I'm seeing how the Chinese work. I'm seeing how they do what they do. And I'm seeing how serious they are. So that leaves an impression on me. And at the same time, I start becoming a poet of note that I start traveling to universities and the universities are paying me like $5,000 per performance. Now, why did they start paying me so much money and why was I able to get them? Because um, number one, I decided to, um, okay, yeah, Evanston, Illinois, definitely. I know Evanston very well. I spent a summer at uh, Northwestern University uh, doing organic chemistry. I used to drive to Evanston every day, big up Kai. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know, I know Evanston very well. But yeah, Georgia is definitely an improvement from Evanston, Illinois. You know, but remember, you're still, you're still, you're still paying uh, state income taxes, and so you might want to be, a, you might want to think about saving 15 percent of your income if you can by moving to a place that doesn't have state income taxes. Why? There's no benefit, like if, unless you just got to be in that state, but. You know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out ways that we can move around because we're world citizens and we want to see the world and live in different parts of the world. And some of the best things that you can do for your children is to let them go to school in different countries. That's the best gift you can give for your children. My son, you know, he's he's got my son's passport looks nice, like it's stamped real nice. From when he was born, he's been traveling internationally. He's gone to school internationally. He's gone to school in Rwanda, loves it. You get what I'm saying? So um, he learns about, you know, one of his best friends when he was in school recently in Rwanda was from Afghanistan. He never knew about Afghanistan. <laughs> like, you know, so now as like a seven year old kid, eight year old kid, he knows about Afghanistan. He knows about their culture because his homie Walid is from Afghanistan. And this is like a great education. You know what I'm saying? So um I start doing poetry and start traveling around the country and I start getting gigged in the Caribbean, gigs in the Caribbean. I start getting gigs in Africa. Now, the reason why I start getting gigs over a lot of other poets is because I made it very easy this with me. What do I mean by that? And this was one of the, the cheat codes was is that so artists tend to be very like finicky in particular, like artists are some of the most difficult people to deal with. Very tedious group of people as artists, right? Because they live in a, a different type of world. Artists aren't very practical. The artists are just different. But I was, I was not only just an artist, I was right brain and left brain, right? So one of the tricks that I would do when people would ask me about booking me is, and this is one small thing, and this is one of the things that I learned in terms of doing business is that if you're doing business with someone, and this always carried with me, you have to make it pleasurable to do business with you and make it as easy as possible for people to do business with you. And I learned this very quickly in my artistic career as a poet. So what would happen was when they would ask me to book a show, I would tell them that this is my fee, but with my fee, I would pay for my own play ticket in my own hotel. What does that mean to this person who's booking you? This is what you have to understand. The best money in poetry. So this is the way poets made money around the Love Jones time and like slam and all that type. The way poets made money was you would have a poetry book or you'd have a CD and you would travel to open mics and be a feature poet in open mic. The venue if they're making a lot of money they may break you off a couple hundred dollars but it was up to you to sell your cds so now you've got to write different poems to like kind of 
turn on the audience because you want to go to the lowest hanging fruit. So you might even be like a, a, a political poet, but you might throw some sex poetry in there because you know that's the lowest hanging fruit, fruit and make people go ooh, ah, and all of that. And they'll buy your CD because you need to make money to catch the bus to go to the next city. Well, I didn't go that route. What I did was I went to the universities because why did I go to the universities? Well, when I was in the university, I was the head of the black students organization there called the Pan-African Pan Alliance. And every year we got a budget. We got a budget and the budget came through the student activities office, which gets the general budget. And then the budget gets trickled down to the student group organization. So I understood the infrastructure. So student activities uh, director is the one who was responsible for all the activities for students in colleges. And at the universities, you get paid regardless of how many people show up. So I'm saying, listen, if I'm going to market myself, I'm going to market myself to the best yes possible. So I can spend 30 minutes getting a yes for an open mic place in Atlanta that's not going to pay me anything and I got to sell my CDs and all that stuff. Or I can get a yes from Clark University in Atlanta and they're going to pay me $2,000 or $5,000 to come perform as part of their budget that they have to spend. Because if they don't spend the money that they've been allotted, they get less money for the next year. Okay? So what I did was I made it easy to do business with because the students who were booking me and the student activities directors never had to book my plane tickets. They never had to book my hotels. All they had to do was cut me a check that I got when I got there. They didn't have to deal with any logistics like calling me, what city are you coming from? When are you leaving? What hotel you need to stay? This is tedious for a college student. So I took the tedium away from them and said, listen, you just give me the check, I'll take care of the rest. And as a matter of fact, I'll be there the night before. And what did I do the night before? I would feature at a poetry spot. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So I was double dipping. And they were like, oh, you'll be here the night before, so we don't even have to worry about whether you missed the plane or not or, or anything, because what will happen with a lot of artists, a lot of artists are aloof, they missed the plane, and the whole event is messed up, especially for Black History Month. They're planning, oh, there's a poetry slam, we have an international poet coming in, and this and that, and you mess up the whole thing because you missed your flight. I would come the night before, and I would go do you know, an open mic spot as a feature poet, and I would do it for free. I would never charge them. So guess what happens? your name starts to build up because of course they're gonna take a free poet that is considered a professional poet over someone who's asking for $400, right? So I was able to double dip and that's how I did my poetry career. And I did this for like a decade. And like, it was getting sweet. Like I was getting paid at least 5,000 per, per, per performance. And I was, I was traveling like every two weeks. Every, anyone who knew me around that time, they know what time it was. Like I was gone. I was never in Miami, like in my house in Miami, because I was always traveling, doing shows. And that's what taught me about not only do you master your craft or have a great product, you're going to have to be pleasurable to do business with. And a lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people feel entitled that people should just give you money. No, that's not what it is. You have to make yourself, they would, either, they would actually rather choose someone that they are like easy to do business with than someone who's very difficult to do business with. And most artists are extremely difficult to do business with. So you become a fresh, uh, a breath of fresh air when you're able to do business. And what that was able to allow me to do was I was able to do community, like, you know, like um, activist community performances for free. I would just do those for free because the universities paid me so much that if, you know, the, um, you know, the UNIA asked me to do, you know, Marcus Garvey's organization asked me to perform at their Kwanzaa. They asked me how much I want. I tell them it's free. And they're like, Haru, like, man, the, the last folks were asking us for like a thousand dollars. Isn't that like, it's free. I'm like, yeah, it's free. And they thinking I'm a nice guy, which I am. But what they didn't understand was like, I'll be performing at Howard university. Like, the day after, you know what I'm saying? I'll be, and they'll be paying me. So it's like doing your show is like, I'm not gonna charge you, you pushing Marcus Garvey. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it for free. So 
you pushing pan-Africanism. That's what I'm all about. Like, I'm going to do it for free. I'm not going to charge a poor organization. They don't have the money, but the university's got the money. And that's how I really... So I learned business from the Jewish guy. I learned business from being a lawyer and having my own office. And I learned business as a real hustling entrepreneur, not knowing where your next meal is going to come from. As a poet, like I was a full-time artist. So I stopped doing law. So let me tell you when I stopped doing law. I stopped practicing law. I used to have this beautiful apartment um, in Miami overlooking the bay. And one day I'm there on a Sunday and a sister who I was um, doing a legal case for, it was a personal injury case. She called me on the phone. So what was happening in my life was I would get home every day and I'd have 30 to 40 phone calls of messages of people full of problems, right? 90% of them were not trying to pay me to solve their legal problems because the word got out. Haru's a community lawyer. He's for the people. He'll even do your case for free if you ain't got money. So that word got out. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So people were like, Haru, I got a problem. My cousin got a problem. This one got a problem. This one, you understand? Know so my, this was the time when you like had the landline phones. This was like 2000, 2001. And um, like you'd have like blinking on the phone if you had messages that, you know, that was like that old school. And I used to get home and listen to people's problems. And I could tell it was affecting the quality of my life. I was like, man, I'm not really liking this legal thing. And every time I had to go to court, I was feeling like I was getting an ulcer, man. Like I was having a visceral response to this. So I'm like, this is not cool, but that's just my life right now. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm listening to problems. So I'm actually becoming very averse to human beings at this point because every human being that calls me is calling me with a problem. I no, there's nobody calling me to see how you doing. What's up? Except for some of my homies, you know what I'm saying? There's certain homies, it's like, you know, just homies is homies. So they ain't talking about none of that. So we can philosophize, we can do all of that. But 99% of my human contact was people with problems. And it just didn't sit right with me. So anyway, I get a phone call and remember I'm handling a personal injury case for a sister and that sister is on the phone. This is a Sunday afternoon and I hear her on the phone. I hear people on the phone arguing. They're arguing and I see it's from her, it's from her. Her name is Carolyn and so it's a Jamaican sister, you know what I'm saying? Rude girl, you know, rude gal, Carolyn, you know? Big up Carolyn anywhere you're there, you know? But anyway, she's the reason why I quit practicing law. So here's what happened. I'm hearing Carolyn going on bad with somebody. Blah, blah, da, 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 your bumba clock, this and this and that, right? And she's saying, this is in Miami. And she's like, yo, me have my lawyer upon the phone, man. Heru, deal with these people. I said, Carolyn, what's up? She goes, Heru, I'm at McDonald's and I ordered a Happy Meal and they didn't give me everything that was in the Happy Meal. And I'm talking to the manager right now and I'm telling them that you're my lawyer. My lawyer's on the phone and we're going to sue them. And Heru, deal with these people for me. She puts me on the phone with the manager of McDonald's of a local McDonald's to settle a Happy Meal dispute. Yo, I got off the phone and I said, Carolyn, I can't do this. I, 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 I can't practice law no more, man. Like, it's done, it's over. Because what happened was I, 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 after, after that phone call, I hung up the phone and I went to go look at myself in the mirror. I went to look at myself in the mirror and I said, what have you become, man? Like I really looked at myself and I said, you've become a Happy Meal dispute resolution person. Like that's what you're here for on earth to solve Happy Meal disputes. I said, nah, man, this is not for me. I can't do this. And that was it. I stopped practicing law that day.
That day I stopped everything. Nothing. I didn't answer nothing else. No mail. No. They wanted me to do like um what you call continuing legal education. The Florida bar is writing me do this and do that and like do continue. I, I didn't do nothing. I had um some other person I was representing. They wanted me to fraudulently say his his wife's neck hurt and she, her neck didn't hurt. There's a thing called soft tissue damage and all of this like all type of like really like. Like in, in Jamaica, they call it Gino shit, you know, like real Gino business. You know what I mean? Like real stuff that has nothing to do with justice or truth or whatever. It's basically just subterfuge that you're doing. And it's a game of lies. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, yo, I don't want to participate in this no more. And I don't care if the Florida bar is writing me and this and that. I don't care because guess what? I'm not using the law as a plan B. Being a lawyer is a plan B. Oh, the probate case. So here's what happened. I end up closing a probate case. The probate case closes. I get a lick. I get a lick off of that probate case. And from that probate case, I stopped practicing. I was able to stop practicing law. It happened almost in like it coincided with the Carolyn Happy Meal thing. And I think what happened was I might have gotten the probate case lick like two weeks before that. So I was feeling good. That was like, yo, I got a nice little chunk of money, money I never had before, like tens of thousands of dollars that I had that I could rest and rely on. But I was like, yo, I ain't doing this. I'm just going to be a poet full time because at that time I was making similar money doing poetry and people were saying I was really good at it. And I never, ever tried to be a poet and I never cared of being a poet. Like I just wanted to be a Pan-Africanist and talk my shit. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to talk that black African shit. Like, and if I could do it in the form of rhyme that people liked, like I'll give you Wicked Man Dominion. You want to pay me for Wicked Man Dominion? You want to pay me for these are titles of some of my poems. And I'm just like, yo, you want to, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying, you know, I'm saying things like the Eurocentric black preacher is a creature who's a twisted, demented, double fork tongue teacher. You want to pay me for that? I'm gonna do that. And I'm, I'm and I'll do it. And I would perform for three hours straight. I took it seriously. You know what I'm saying? That's how I was doing it. That's how I was giving it up. And I was like, if you're going to pay me for this, this is the type of life I want to live. But here's what happens. As an artist, you're traveling all the time. There's no stability. And you don't know like when your next check is coming. And if you are someone spitting like consciousness, consciousness has a time run. Like before you start to like, depending on what's happening in the world, people get offended. This and that. And what happened to me was my run stopped when Barack Obama became president. I believe that's 2008. Why did my run stop? Because my poetry was a lot about like the black struggle and the schools who were booking me were like, well, we got a black president now. Everything's good with black folks. We don't need you. <laughs> we don't need you to talk that black shit. We got a black president. Like it's all good. So I saw that they weren't booking like conscious poets after Obama. You know what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? That's why I write, you know, Barack Obama, Septimius Severus. That's a poem that I did. I'm just breaking down Obama. You know what I'm saying? So I got my lick off of Obama on that poem. Put it to the stalag rhythm. Those who know reggae music, we put it to the stalag. Let that rinse for some time. But my bookings at university stopped, and that was my main money. But what happened was around 2000, something seminal happened around 2008, 2009. Two, two big things happened. Um, 2008, 2009, I was in Nigeria. I was asked to uh, perform at what they call the World Music Conference in Nigeria. So I'm in Nigeria hanging out for months. And I'm performing at the World Music Conference. I'm going to Fellas Shrine. I'm doing, you understand what I'm saying? And I catch malaria, y'all. So I catch malaria. And if anyone's ever had malaria, when you get malaria, you get very lucid dreams. And like, I started feeling like I might have had something, but I was still functioning. But one day, like, I woke up 
and my sheets were all wet of sweat, but I wasn't like cold or anything. And then I started shivering and it was 90 degrees, 95 degrees. And I had to go take like a hot shower and I'm still shivering in a hot shower. I said, oh, something's wrong. I take my temperature and it's like 105 degrees. And the sister who's managing me at the time says, Haru, you have 105 degree temperature. You should be like in a coma. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm talking my shit. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm too much of an African to be in a coma. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I'm feeling good, but I'm feeling like mash up. And anyway, I take a thing called artesanate. That's one of the best things for, and it's made out of art. It's from Artemisia Anua. It's one of the things that's very good for, uh, for malaria. It cleared up my malaria in about three days. It also turns out that it kills cancer as well, which those of you who've gotten my book, you know all about it, that basically most of these cancers are caused by parasites. And so if you take an anti-parasitical, like artesanate, artemisia, whatever, they actually have studies that show that it kills cancer and people can reverse their cancer with it. That's a whole different live stream, right? We don't need to talk about that book right now. But um, it cleared up my malaria. But during that time, when you're having malaria, you get um, yeah, it tastes terrible because parasites hate bitter because they love sweets. Parasites love sugar. Parasites grow in sugar. Tumors grow in sugar. So the opposite of that is bitter. It turns out that bitter is very important. That's why the elders would say, you know, take your bitters and all of that. And um, is actually uh, very important because it turns out that cancer tumors have a bitter receptor on them. So whenever you taste something bitter, it triggers the receptor and causes cancer cells to commit suicide. That's a whole different thing. We can get into those studies later, but bitter is very important. That's why like in West Africa before like the elders meet, they eat cola nut under a tree. And it's actually something that is stimulating the bitter receptors and getting rid of parasites. So people are doing parasite cleanses and don't even realize it. And also killing cancer cells and don't even realize it when they do their bitters. So anyway, um, I'm having lucid dreams while I have malaria. And check this out. In my one of my lucid dreams, I hear a voice. Now, listen, I'm not into no spookism and I'm not into like, I'm not into none of that, right? But I, I just go with what the reality is. Like, I'm not someone like, if I see a spaceship, I'm gonna tell you, yo, I saw a spaceship. I don't care what you like say. You know what I'm saying? Like, I saw a spaceship. I'm not saying that I have, but I'm just saying that if I, if certain things happen, I'm just gonna say what it is. So, what happened to me was in my dream, there was a voice that said, there are no magic words that are gonna get us out of this situation as a people. Yo, that hit me hard because those who would know, um, there was a group of us poets, particularly in Miami, who was very serious about this African liberation thing. And that's the only reason why we wrote poetry. So there was two sets of poets. I would actually say some of the best poets during that time when poetry was huge were in Miami. Like, forget what you heard. Like, I went all over the country. I went all over the world. Some of the best poets I ever heard were in Miami. Like, and people would come down. And they'd be like, wow. People thought it was New York, but it was actually Miami. And it was like, people were like, what's in the water here? Like, we were wild. Like, some of the greatest poets were in Miami. And they were Pan-Africanist poets. So there were two separate types of poets. There was those who was Pan-Africanist and those who were in poetry because they just liked being poets. So they were down to write poetry about anything and everything. And then there was the people who were just what you'd call conscious poets. And they only did, so I was in that group. I only did poetry because of consciousness. I didn't care about doing poetry. Like I didn't want to be a roses are red, violets are blue. I wasn't into like going to poetry classes and going to like poetry events just to hear poets talk. No, I want you to talk that African shit. I want to hear that. You understand what I'm saying? I need to hear you. You got to say something that I like to hear. You understand what I'm saying? Like bun down Babylon, something. You got to say something that turns me on. And what turned me on was that Pan-Africanist talk. And so I'm about you using your art to uplift our people. And if you're not doing that, I don't even want to hear you. So I wasn't really even a poet per se. I was more like a Pan-Africanist who accidentally did poetry and happened to be pretty good at it. 
that's what I was. I wasn't a poet. I was more of a Pan-Africanist who just had the skill for poetry, right? So I just put all my thoughts into rhyme and poetry, right? So when I heard that there's no magic words that's going to solve our problems, it devastated me, y'all. And it also became clear to me that it was true. There's no magic word or no magic poem that I'm going to do that's going to change our condition. And then it also became clear for me that, yo, who really has power in this world? And when you really break it down, it's not the politicians, it's business people. The people who control business, people who control industry are the ones who fund politicians and political campaigns and control policy. I said that if I really wanna change the plight of our people, I'm gonna to have to become a businessman, period. And from that moment on, I never wrote another poem. And I used to write poetry prolifically. Anyone who's seen me perform poetry, my poems were like 10 minutes long for one poem. And I had many of them. And they were all committed to memory. You never saw me choking. You never saw me messing up. You never saw me like it was just a part of who I was. I had a three hour show. like. I would perform for three hours straight without a break. Poem after poem after poem after poem. Because I took it seriously because I believed that it was going to help free up our people with consciousness because the artists that I love, they dedicated their lives to Bob Marley's, the, you understand what I'm saying? The Peter Tosh's, these people, the fellas, they used music and art as a weapon. And I was part of that cloth, but when I understood the truth that there are no magic words that's going to change our situations, that it's the business people who change our situation and the people who control industry, man, it devastated me. But I knew what had to be done. And I decided that I would become a businessman. And so I started a company called Movement Tunes. Um, that was a digital download business. I got venture capital funding in Barbados, they got Basil Springer. Um, I spent a lot of time in Barbados, enough, enough people I love in Barbados, big up my brother Heru in Barbados, big up the sister Jalit and crew, you know, enough people, Jason Green, Adrian Green, all these people in Barbados and started a digital download focus on conscious music. It was like a conscious iTunes until they started streaming music. Um, people were buying digital downloads and so I decided that if I was making money with digital downloads, if I multiplied myself by a thousand and I had a library because whenever I would travel to different countries, I went on TV. When I was in Jamaica, I would go on national TV, Barbados, I'd go on TV, Nigeria, I'm on TV, Ghana, I'm on TV, different places I went in the world, I'm going on TV. Um, and so when I'm performing, artists think that like I'm a big artist and they're giving me their CDs because they're thinking I can help them with their career. But then I go home and I play their music and they're like great artists that the world needs to hear, but I have this library. So I started to start movement tunes. So we start movement tunes and it sounds like a great idea at the time. And a lot of the artists weren't getting distribution because I applied for iTunes in 2001 and iTunes rejected me. They said I need to be with a major record label. So I learned digital download technology and I started making money in my sleep. So I would perform instead of lugging suitcases of CDs with me that people had to buy or people ordering online. And whenever I'm traveling, I have to go find a post office to go to, which really took a large, large part of my day. People would just do digital downloads. So I, I learned how to do computer coding with digital download and do it myself. So in this, this way, I started becoming a person who started learning everything. I had a website designer. And those of you all who are artists know that like your web designer, your film editor, these people always by law are late. They never do the work when you need it done. So like I had a website designer who was just making changes on my, like when I would be doing tours, I'll be in this state, I'll be at this, whatever, just to make the updates. I didn't know HTML. So I would ask him to do updates and he would never do it on time. And so like, there was like three weeks he wasn't doing anything. And I actually showed up at his house and kidnapped him. I literally kidnapped him 
got him from his house, put him in my car, drove him to my place, went on my computer, and he had to show me HTML and what he was doing. So I learned how to do HTML from kidnapping my website designer. Big up, Ra. You know what I'm saying? His name is Ra. Ra Howard, you know, I don't know where he is now, but big up to Ra. But I had to literally kidnap him that day to show me how to do the coding. And that's how I learned how to build my own websites. So now I'm building a website for thousands of artists to have their catalogs. And we're doing a 60-40 split. They keep 60%. The company keeps 40% because this is what iTunes was doing. It was the same thing. So um, this is how I get my first foray into serious business. I then um, start looking at solar energy because remember, I'm living in Nigeria and I'm also living in Germany time too, just around 2010. Remember, I'm going all over the place because I'm, I'm still in, I was still known as an artist, but I, remember, I stopped writing poetry. But every now and then, someone might ask me to perform because of the residue of the mark that I left. And so I would do it if they like gave me a nice amount and they, had me travel to a country that I like. And so I ended up in Jamaica. I forgot where I was performing in Jamaica. And in Jamaica, I, I ended up living in a Kampong town, which is um, Maroon Town, St. Elizabeth and Trelawney. Big up, big up man like Riggy. Big up my man Marshall, who passed away, man. Marshy, I, you know, in um, Jamaica, you know. Jamaica is like really kind of like a second home to me. And if you've never been to Jamaica as a black person, you need to go to Jamaica because. I never laugh so much until I'm in Jamaica. Like I laugh so much because of the way that people stay in Jamaica, the stories they tell, the, the, the personalities. I actually end up pulling muscles laughing so much in Jamaica, you know, from the relationships I have and just the Jamaican people are just the best, man. And um, so I'm there and um, I'm seeing that they're having problems with their pump, the water pump. So we're fetching water in the hills, in the mountains, man. And if you've ever been to a Kampong town, if you've never been there. So Kampong town is, so the, the village or the city, a Kampong town is way up on the mountains. So the village of the city is um, Magati. So Magati is on the base of the mountain. It's like where people live. And then you have to drive about 45 minutes up a mountain and you have to go with a taxi driver who knows the road. Because if you don't know that road and you make a wrong turn, you're driving off a cliff and it's way up in the clouds, man. And you're driving up there and you're like, man, our ancestors had to go all the way up here to get away from these crackers. Like this is big deal to see and people going on foot and building whole lives and houses and societal systems away from the mess that's going on down there. You're like in a different world. And it takes you about 45 minutes by car to get there from the next town. Like it's no joke. I would not advise anybody to drive up that mountain <laughs> from Magati if you've never been there before. You'll drive off the cliff and you'll die. You gotta go with people who know that place. Like, it's really serious. So I'm there and I'm seeing that they're having water issues. And then I'm seeing that there's, wow, there's electricity issues. In Nigeria, I'm seeing electricity issues. In Nigeria, the electricity issues are as follows. So at that time in Ghana, they would have, um, they would have what you call like load shedding. Um, so they would, they would have times, like they would have timed blackouts. So that time in Ghana, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, it was three times a week, I think. From 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., electricity is out. In Ghana, they told you that. 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., electricity is out. This was like in 2000, this was probably 2008 time when I'm in Ghana, in Nigeria. But in Nigeria, the electricity, they're not as, they're not as, they're not as polite. So in Nigeria, the electricity can go out for two minutes, two hours, or two days without any notice. This was in 98. Um, no, not 90, around 2008 when I was there. Like literally like going, living there, going back and forth between Ghana and Nigeria. And I, you know, I, I got a whole, we could do a whole different live about 
Lagos. <laughs> Lagos is a whole different. And I'm telling you right now, if you want to go to Africa and you want to experience Africa as like true Africa, you have to go to Nigeria and you have to go to Lagos. Because if you go there, you'll understand what it means to be African because Nigeria is Africa plus tax. It's blackness plus tax. Like Lagos is a whole different universe unto itself. And you get to understand, like, first of all, we ain't going nowhere as black folks, okay? Don't let anyone ever tell you that black folks are endangered. Anyone who says that black people are an endangered species have never been to Lagos. You've never seen so many black people in your life. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, Lagos is a whole different thing. And if you're in Lagos and you spend time in Lagos, you can make it in any other part of Africa. So if you want like baptism by fire in terms of the African experience, just go to Lagos first. And that's it. Like everything else is easy from there. If you can navigate in Lagos and you can do your thing in Lagos and because Nigeria, Nigerians are fun people. They have the, them and Jamaicans, they have the best use of language. If you're into language and you into how people talk and the way people use words and sayings and the way, like if you love that about our people, Nigeria and Jamaica is where you need to go. It's, 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 it's incredible. This is an in, 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 incredible place, man. So anyway, in Nigeria, the electricity goes out at any time and comes back at any time. There's no warning. So anyway, um, I got to find out that in Lagos, if you go to the Nigeria Power Company, I forget what they're called, Nigeria Energy or something, I don't know what it's called, but they have some acronym. You can go to them and you can pay them this is in 2008. I don't know what it's like right now. I'm sure not much has changed. This is Nigel we're talking about. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. NEPA. Okay, NEPA. Probably um, Nigeria Energy and Power Associates. I don't know what it is, but they control the electricity there. You can go to a NEPA office and you can pay them and you can tell them, listen, today's my birthday. I'm having a birthday party. On this part in this particular neighborhood block, this is where I live. Please do not turn off the electricity. You pay them and they will keep the electricity on for you because you're having a birthday party. Then I found out that the Syrians and the Lebanese, they own the businesses that bring in generators. They own the shops that sell generators. Everybody who has money has a generator because when electricity goes out, the generators kick in right away. And so you hear it and they're, you know, powered by diesel. So, you know, in Lagos, you would just hear generators running for those who could afford it. But what I found out was that the Lebanese and the Syrians, they controlled the market and they literally would pay the power company to turn off the electricity so that people would buy more generators. And I said, okay, all right. So they can't get money in their country. So they come into Africa to get money and they're just using the African suffering to, to make money. And I'm like, yo, it's all good. Um, it is what it is. Like they're playing to win. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And here's the problem. Um, this is Africa we've got sunshine. The way we go against this is, is that we need to learn solar technology. We learn solar technology and make solar panels. And guess what solar panels are made of? They're made out of silicon. Guess what silicon is made of? It's made out of quartz sand. Guess where quartz sand deposits are in the largest abundance in the world? The Sahara. See me, I don't believe in fractions. I want all of the Sahara. It's so one of the things that I have in line, like I got some other things I got to do is to take the, the sand from the Sahara and turn it into solar panels in a factory all over the Sahel. Now that they're kicking out the French, like I actually, I want to go 
to um, like I was in Sierra Leone last year, big up the people of Sierra Leone, Gambia and all of that. I want to go to um, the Sahel, Niger, Mali, all these places that's kicking out the French. I want to go there and talk to them. And I want to talk about like setting up solar panel manufacturing factories because they're in the Sahara. And we could take all of that sand and convert it to silicon wafers and have cheap solar panels for all of Africa. You understand what I'm saying? This is where this is where my head is at. And it comes from understanding the opium wars that I explained to you all earlier. So when I was in Jamaica, living in a Kampong town, I'm seeing that there's problems with electricity. They're having problems with the pump. And I'm like, yo, like we're in Jamaica, we got sunlight. Why, why aren't people learning about solar technology? So I'm doing my own research on solar technology and I decided that, yo, I need to get trained in solar technology because this is gonna be a solution for our people. So, so what I did was I literally signed up for um, training as a solar um, engineer, solar installation and design at the Florida Solar Institute, at the US Solar Institute in Miami. So I went from Jamaica to Miami because what I did was I went to, so in Jamaica, the biggest cell phone company at the time, um, I don't know if they are still, they might just Digicel. So the thing was that Digicel, they gave a grant every year to new ideas. Like they would, they would dish out money like 50,000, 100,000 US. And I saw it and I applied to the Digicel grant and I had to get a university to work with me. So I chose UTech. Big up all the people at UTech, you know? UTech is right down the street from UE. Uh, it's, it's close to um, Hope Gardens area where um, like it's close to like Bob Marley's house and all that. So anybody who goes to like, it's like Ligany and them type of area. If you've been in Jamaica, you've been in Kingston, you know what I'm talking about. You go up the road to the left is UTech and to the, so you pass Bob Marley's house and then you see Hope Gardens and then you'll see, um, you'll see UTech, which is like the technological university there where the engineers are. And then UE's on the right. So you go to UE and then you go past there, you go to August town. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So Jamaica's like second home to me. So like, I love Jamaica, big up all Jamaicans, you know? So um, I go there and I talk to the professors there and they're like, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but they didn't get a curriculum in time together. So I wasn't able to get the grant but I needed to do my own training. So I went and I got trained and, uh, you know, not to big up myself, but I graduated class valedictorian. So what I'm just telling you is that, listen, it's not that I'm smarter than anybody. It's just that like, when I'm focused, I'm focused. And if I care about something, I care about something. So it was necessary for our people, solar energy and solar technology. So I got involved in that. And that led me to now go to the University of Virgin Islands uh, to work for their Caribbean Green Technology Center because I was certified in solar installation and they were doing a Caribbean Green Technology Center. And the dean of my law school uh, ended up being the president of the University of Virgin Islands. And so we linked up and I ended up moving to the Virgin Islands, the Virgin Islands for about a decade. During that time, uh, I see a documentary called Run From The Cure and Run From The Cure has uh, showing that there's a guy named Rick Simpson who's reversing cancer with cannabis oil. And I'm like, yo, this is like big news. Why isn't the world stopping and, and watching this? So I started doing experiments with cannabis oil. I started doing lectures about cannabis oil and start traveling to different places in the United States. I go to the Caribbean, test the oil to, in Jamaica, meet with people at UE, the laboratories and all. That's a whole different, you know, that's a whole different stream unto itself. I can go into story time with that too. Um, anyway, uh, and that's how I get into herbal results. So what happened was, was that um, cannabis had too many negatives associated with it in terms of it being a schedule one drug that I could not ship because people literally at the time, for those who know St. Thomas, St. Thomas Virgin Islands is one of the most beautiful islands you can be in. That's where I lived. Like that's a vacation spot. 
everywhere you live, you probably have a view of the Caribbean Sea or the Atlantic Ocean, like everywhere, because it's a mountainous. The, top, the topographical nature of St. Thomas is mountainous. And so anywhere you live, you're going to be living on a mountain somewhere, pretty much. And you're going to have a beautiful view. And the weather is beautiful until, you know, the hurricanes come. So I already talked about the hurricanes last time, but, you know, my life in the Virgin Islands was a beautiful life, man. And, uh, you know, I'm doing work in solar energy and feeling good about doing good work. But I find out that cannabis is healing cancer. And, um, oh, someone asked about the opium wars. What type of tea is it? Okay, so check this out. Just to go back to that, to answer that for the sister who just asked uh, Ami when I explained the ocean, opium wars. So after the British taking of Hong Kong, they still wanted tea. The Chinese didn't want to give tea to them anymore. So after they did the opium wars, the British had at the same time colonized India. So when they colonized India, they took a part of India just to grow tea. Which part of India was it? It's a part of India that used to be called Ceylon. It's an island off of India called Ceylon. Guess what it's called today? It's called Sri Lanka. But Ceylon, which is now called Sri Lanka, is the name of the most popular tea in the world because they took Sri Lanka Ceylon to grow their own tea that they would have imported to England to be able to satisfy and satiate their addiction for tea without having to go to the Chinese anymore. So they took a whole part of India just to grow tea, Ceylon, and the most popular tea in the world is called Ceylon tea. That's what it's called. So that's to answer your question, Ami. They took that place just to grow tea and the brand is called Ceylon tea. And it's been renamed Sri Lanka as a country. And that's the history there. So um, I start finding out a different plant um, that might be able to do what cannabis doing in, term, in terms of cancer reversal. And I find the leaves of the olive tree through research is reversing cancer tumors within nine and 12 days. Not only is it, re, is it um, taking care of cancer tumors in nine and 12 days, it's also reversing high blood pressure. Not only is it reversing high blood pressure, it's reversing uh, diabetes. And I'm like, yo, this is the plant that I need to deal with. So the problem with cannabis is that a lot of people couldn't handle the high, the price was expensive, and it's illegal to ship. So I'm seeing something that doesn't have any of those qualities, doesn't make people high, it's not illegal. So I start dealing with the leaves of the olive tree. By that time, I had learned how to extract medicine from plants very well. Um, I learned about solubility, which a lot of people don't speak about when it comes to plants, because not all med the medicine of plants, not all of them are water soluble. So if you boil it in water, and it's not water soluble or hydrophilic, it won't work. Some have to be boiled in fats, mainly coconut oil. And as a matter of fact, cannabinoids are lipophilic and hydrophobic, which means hydrophobic, they don't like water. Lipophilic, lipo meaning fat, like liposuction. Um, and don't be intimidated by any of these scientific words. They just break down. They're just usually Latin words that break down into English. You just have to know what it is. That's all medicine is all about. They're just using Latin words for your body parts, and then they add the word itis to the end of it, which just means inflammation or fire or flame, right? So conjunctivitis, dermatitis, um, myocarditis, all this is just like, you know, laryngitis. They're just using latin terms for the body parts and adding itis to it that's mainly medical nomenclature so anyway you have to find out the solubility characteristics of the medicinal ingredients of each plant then you can start extracting the medicine from the plants knowing that whether it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic or lipophobic or lipophilic right it turns out that cannabinoids are 
lipophilic and hydrophobic. So you can't boil cannabis in water and draw the medicine from it. You have to actually boil it in milk and uh, or coconut oil. So I developed a coconut oil extraction technique. So anyway, um, and I got one or two, I got two people's uh, whose cancer got reversed with my coconut oil extraction. One guy out of Philly and another cat out of uh, Grenada. But anyway, um, uh, and the Philly guy was actually, his father was from Jamaica. So um, I start with the olive leaf and this is where it gets, we rubber meets the road in terms of serious business and where I was able to have economic independence um, and not have to work at the university anymore or anything like that. Um, I started making olive leaf extract and I've made it from my house. And as any good scientist would do, you test it on yourself first. So I tested it on myself. And the first thing it did is it got rid of the eczema that I had behind my ears for over 20 years. And then it got rid of my asthma. The reason why I knew it got rid of my asthma is because weeks before I took the olive leaf, I was in Dominica. So I was in Dominica. You know, Dominica is a beautiful island. My wonderful wife, she comes from Dominica, beautiful woman from Dominica, took me to her island. I'm spending time in her island. The problem is her island is actually more steep than St. Thomas. So I'm walking from one place to the next and I'm winded, exhausted, like I'm dying because I've had asthma all my life, athletic asthma. And I'm like, this is crazy. And I take the olive leaf and I'm able to like, walk up the hills with no problem, even run up the hills. And I'm not having these problems. It's just my body might be tired, like my muscles, but my heart is not winded, right? I mean, my lungs are not like inflamed and I'm not winded. So I said, wow, this olive leaf is really working. And I give it to friends of mine who have high blood pressure and they have diabetes. And we're reversing the high blood pressure from like I have numbers of like 210 over 120 reversed to like 126 over 70 within 24 hours. I'm like, damn, this olive leaf is really working. And then it's working for diabetes. And um, I'm starting to sell every weekend. They have a thing called Bordeaux's Farmer's Market. All the people in VI know Bordeaux. Bordeaux is the west side of the island where the Rasta people stay at. And they have like this place called Bordeaux Farmer's Market. It's run by Rastas. Big up Mama Benita. You know what I mean? Big up all the men like um, Nashamba and these deep people, man. Like real serious people, you know? Good people. Mama Benita being like really the queen mother of agriculture in, in um, St. Thomas, you know? And uh, I used to sell the olive leaf out of my car. And there used to be people lined up to buy the olive leaf bottles that I made in my house. And the word was spreading. Turned out that one of my neighbors owned a pharmacy and he started hearing about the olive leaf. He decided to carry it at his pharmacy and it became the number one selling item at his pharmacy. Then I get a phone call from a man who uh, says, uh, hey, is this a you the brother who makes the olive leaf extract? I said, yeah. And he says, um, I'd like to just tell you thank you, man. I said, yeah, thank you for what? He says, well, I had prostate cancer and I took your olive leaf extract and I no longer have prostate cancer. So I just want you to, I want you to, I just want to tell you thank you and anything you need, let me know. I said, I do need something. I need you to come to Bordeaux. We're close to where I live and let me videotape you and you tell your story. And if you go on herbalresults.net, you will see his story. It's Dr. Charles Harrigan. That's the first person that called me to let me know that his cancer was reversed with the product that I made in my house. Then I get another phone call for another a woman named um, Velma Samuel. And uh, she had a breast tumor. She was in like breast cancer. She took it and it got rid of her breast tumor. And um, she told her story as well. I, you know, I videotaped her at the beach, um, the beach by the University of Virgin Islands. Everyone knows that beach. 
And so I'm there. That's called Brewers Bay Beach. You know what I'm saying? For VI people, you all know what I'm talking about, man. I, I like to give receipts. You know what I'm saying? Make sure, let you know I ain't making this up. So I like to give names, you know? So um, here's the problem, y'all. The problem is, is the olive leaf, and this is the problem for all entrepreneurs. The olive leaf was making me good money and it was doing great for the world. But it was a prison. What do I mean by that? I was getting so many orders for the olive leaf because there's so many people sick. I was making it myself because I didn't trust anyone else to make it right. There's a whole procedure to make it. I was making it myself. And I was doing 18 hour days and sleeping for six hours and waking up and going straight to a certain part of my house where I was making the olive leaf. I was doing the bottling, I was doing everything. So it was a beautiful thing when I would get orders, but I also hated getting orders because I knew that it, that means my time would, so whenever I would get an order for like four cases, five cases of olive leaf, a case of 25 bottles, I knew how much time it would take to actually do it. I knew my whole day would be gone and I have to do 18 hours and people make the order, they want it as soon as possible because this is for sick people. And people started depending on the olive leaf because they were using pharmaceuticals that were causing bad side effects like the pharmaceuticals for high blood pressure, like lisinopril and those types of things that are ACE inhibitors, they cause kidney failure, right? They cause acute, acute renal failure. So people were preferring to use the olive leaf for their high blood pressure instead of something that was affecting their kidneys. And for a lot of men, the high blood pressure medications affects their libido as well. So a lot of them were impotent because of their high blood pressure medication and they didn't want that. And the olive leaf would get them back into form. So, um, and this is for people who are diabetic, people who got cancer. And so it's like, I had to make it. And if I didn't make it, people were calling me saying, yo, I'm sick. I need this. This is the only thing that I need. So it's like people's lives were depending on this, but I had to actually dedicate every living hour to making olive leaf. Now, here's the thing. I told you all around 2005, I read the four hour work week. So here's the thing. We do businesses so that we can be free. What is the point of having economic freedom if you don't have time freedom? I'm going to say that again. There is no point in having economic freedom if you don't have time freedom. And we get to find out that time and money are the two biggest commodities in modern society. What do I mean by that? Well, you find out what is most important in a society based on how they punish you. I want y'all to follow me. In the societies that we live in, if you're convicted of a crime, there's only two punishments. They will fine you money or they will fine you time. In that way, they're telling you what's the two most important things that they can take away from you is your money or your time. Then we get to find out that time is actually more important than money. Why do I say that? Any billionaire will give away their billions if they find out they have one hour to live. And in exchange for the billions, they can get 10 more years. Any billionaire, and actually, any billionaire who's 80 years old right now is jealous of a 20-year-old who doesn't have any money, and they would trade places with that 20-year-old. An 80-year-old billionaire will change places with a 20-year-old because they would say, well, I get to be young again. That's more important than money. Time is more important than money. So this is the part that we're missing. We're thinking that this pursuit of money is the ultimate pursuit. No, it's a means to an end. And that end 
is having time to yourself where you can wake up when you want, sleep when you want, spend time with the people you love when you want. That is true wealth. And so I understood that. And being locked into a business where I had no time, but I was making money hand over fist. Like literally, I was getting cash and I had drawers full of cash, but I had no time and I was miserable. A wife can tell you all, I was miserable. I barely got sleep, but we were making money to the point where I didn't have to work at the university anymore. I literally quit my job at the university and all I was doing was olive leaf. And I was making money, but I had no time. I felt like a slave and I felt like a prisoner. And the only reason why I didn't want to have a job or work for anyone is because I didn't want to feel like a slave or a prisoner. So how now do I have a job where I own the business, but I have no time to myself? And then something very special happened. Um, my wife, is she's very... She's very um, creative in uh, making food. She can make anything. So she started making a thing called like chickpea tofu. And so she used to make it and it used to be in great demand in the Virgin Islands, those of you who know. And so she decided that she wanted to take it to Bordeaux at one of the festivals. And this white man comes up to her and says, who makes this chickpea tofu? And she goes like, oh, I do. It's part of the business. She had other, the other herbal results products up there. And the white guy says, um, I'd like to talk to you. My wife says, well, you know, you need to speak to my husband, as any dutiful wife will do, right? Like a man, some man, some strange man's talking to you and wants to like get more information. She said, no, talk to my husband, right? Because that's the type of protocol we have, right? So she calls me, says, oh, there's this guy who wants to talk to you about the business. And I'm like, yeah, cool. Turns out. This guy is like filthy rich millionaire. He owns a distribution, a food distribution company called Edward and Sons. His name is Joel. The guy Joel calls me and says, um, I like what you're doing. I like your products. Um, I'd like to meet you so you can ask me anything you want. This is what he says to me. I said, meet you so I can ask you. Yeah, he said, yeah, yeah. I like your products. I'd like, I'd like to meet you. I said, man, that's kind of unique. You don't know me from anybody. You don't, like, I don't know you. He says, yeah, come to my house. He invites me to his house. I said, cool. I go to this guy's house. He's building a house literally on sand at the beach in the Virgin Islands. And he just moved to the Virgin Islands. It turns out that his father is a guy named Edward who founded, came from Europe somewhere, came to live in the United States with no money, starts working and founded a company where he makes the candy. Do y'all remember that candy that like was like round, um, like tablets with different colors? And it was like a string. It looked like a, like a, a string of like little tablets and it had like these different colors. Well, that's that guy's father. Like we grew up eating it like, like sweet tart candy, like it had different colors. Well, that's that guy's father. I was like, damn, that's your father? He's like, yeah, yeah, it's my father. And, and then he gets into the family business, but he's more conscious. He doesn't want to do candy. He wants to do healthy foods. So they start making like um, kimchi and stuff out of Japan. He tells me his story. I mean, I get to this guy's house. He's building a huge mansion on the beach in St. Thomas. He invites me there. He has a gate. He has several acres. In St. Thomas, you don't get acres because land is so expensive. But this guy was a multimillionaire, so he bought acres. So he had a whole compound, like something you'd have in Africa in terms of like the amount of land he had. In St. Thomas, even if you're wealthy, you get like half an acre at the most, right? And build your little mansion there. But this guy, we start sitting down and I, I start asking him, he starts telling me his life story. But I'm noticing, he's like, you want to go take a swim? I said, no, nah, I ain't come here to swim. I, I, I want to hear, like, I want you to just, like, soak me with game. And he's so...
Yeah, y'all can still hear me? Let me know if you can still hear me. He said something about my mic. So anyway, he's soaking me with game. Um, just text in the chat and just let me know you can hear me. Can you still hear me? Okay, yeah. So he's soaking me with game, and I'm realizing that this guy, Joel, first of all, when I meet him, he looks like Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead. He's a long-haired hippie with white hair. And he's chilling. And he's running a multi, multi-million dollar business. It's called Edward and Sons. Y'all can look it up. He tells me his story. And then he says something to me that changed my life. He says, I said, so how are you running your business? He says, man, I got, I got factories that make my, the products. He told me how he went to Japan and he got Japanese factories to make his, um, like the fermented tofu. And then he picked up other brands and how he went to different stores. He told me his strategy for getting his products in the stores and everything. He, he, he gave me, I mean, he gave me mentorship. I don't know why these old white men like me when they meet me. Like, I don't know, you know, but he soaked me. He was giving me some ism. Like he was just soaking me with ism. He was telling me exactly how he built his empire off of food and food products. And it hit me that I was not following the four hour work week and I was explaining to him that I have no damn time in my life, that I'm making these products that are helping people, but I have no time. I have money, but I have, I have no time. So I've actually defeated the purpose of business or being an entrepreneur or being independent. Because like I said, the two most valuable things is money and time. That's how they punish you in this society. They've already told you what's valuable. I had money, but I had no time, so I was not free. I, I couldn't enjoy anything. I couldn't go anywhere. It's just like, basically, I have friends you know, that went to law school. They're making you know, a salary of $300,000, but they have no time. They have no time. My father was a surgeon in uh, Chicago. The man had no time. He made good money, but he, he had no time. His time wasn't his. And I saw very early in my entrepreneurial career that if I'm going to be an entrepreneur, I've got to have my own time or it's not worth it. So I'm listening to Joel talk and I'm like, yo, this is really interesting, man how he's been able to build his empire. And he's telling me he's got contract manufacturers making his products. And I'm like, damn, I got the work, four hour work week like a decade ago. And one of the chapters in there is about using contract manufacturers to make your products. Why am I making my own olive leaf when I can find a manufacturer that makes herbal tinctures give them my formula, sign an NDA, because I'm a lawyer, so I can read my own contracts. And that's what I did. Yeah. I went on a search. I vetted some companies to make my product according to my specifications. And then, so I got a factory, and then the shipping was another part of it too. You see, every day when I got orders online, I'd have to go to the post office and ship the orders out which was very time consuming every day. And coming off the mountains on the west side of Fortuna, Bordeaux going into town every single day in St. Thomas, it was very time consuming. I mean, I would be rushing, I'd be coming at, at the end, all of the postal people knew me, knew me by name. Cause I'd come at the end of the day, right before they closed and they hated it because I had boxes to ship of olive leaf and yeah, I didn't trust anyone to make it in terms of employees coming to make it. But when you have a factory that's a contract manufacturer, they are contracted to make it. Whereas if you hire people and you teach them how to make it, sometimes they show up to work, sometimes they don't. And it messes up everything that you're doing. So when you have a contract manufacturer, this is what they do professionally. And you have a contract with them and they turn out 
thousands and thousands of bottles for you. And I looked at it and I was like, that's the way I have to go. And then I had what you call a third party shipper to deal with the problem of me having to pack olive leaf bottles, store them, first of all, you have to store them somewhere. If you get them from the factory, you're going to have to have a warehouse. And then from that warehouse, every time you get an order, you have to pick from the warehouse and then pack the order and ship it to people. And people say, where's my order? At? I ordered out of leave from you, Heru. I haven't seen it. And it's because I haven't gone to the post office today. Right. And it was all in my hands. I was doing every single aspect of the business, which I advise everyone to do, by the way, because then you will know your business intimately, but it should not be a way of life. Just like what I'm doing with the mango farm now, I can break that down in another live, but I do every single aspect of the mango business so that I don't have to do it in the future. And then I'll know whenever someone's not doing the right thing because I've done every aspect. I mean, every aspect from the minuscule. So like with the olive leaf, I can look at the olive leaf and see if they did it right, right? I can just look at it and know if it was done according to my specifications, because I know it so intimately. I can look at other olive leaf products and I know that they're cutting the product or diluting it because I know what real olive leaf looks like. And most of these companies are actually diluting their product and they're adding food coloring to it. That's why Herbal Results works better than most companies because um, they're just cutting corners, right? And I don't cut corners. Like I don't dilute my product because you see, what people have to understand is that when you find something that frees you economically, that thing becomes holy and sacred. And you're going to do everything to keep the name of that company in good graces, your brand, because that brand has given you freedom. So I do not play with my customers. My customers are sacred because they didn't have to buy Herbal Results Olive Leaf. They could have bought any other companies, but if they're going to buy products from me, I'm going to make sure that they get the best thing possible and they get the best service possible. And if they get a bottle and it's leaking, I will ship them a new bottle at no argument, no cost, no nothing. You get a bottle and you say it's leaking or something was wrong with it. I don't argue with you because you're sacred to me as a customer, because what you've done for me is you've given me a lifestyle that I've only dreamt about. See, this is the thing is that nobody owes you anything. Nobody has to support you. And this is the problem with a lot of folks who get into business. We think that people should support us. No, people are not supporting you. People are only doing business with you because your product solves their problem. It's very selfish. And I understand that. Like, I don't even, when you pump gas, you're not trying to put money in the pockets of the Rockefellers. You're not trying to support the Rockefellers when you, pump gasoline, even though they own the gas stations, Standard Oil and all of that, Exxon and all of that. No, you're getting it because it benefits you. You're not trying to support the Rockefeller Fund family. And so for the same reason, nobody's trying to support me when they buy my product. That's why I try to tell people never, business owners never get into, oh, I need you all to support me and this and that. No, people do not shop to support you. They shop to support themselves. And so what you've got is you've got a value proposition that you need to present to the people that if you buy my product, it's going to solve your problem better than these other products. That's all they want to know. So I make sure that I make the best product in the world, not just for you know uh, my community or whatever. It's the best in the world. That's why I have people from Poland buying my product. I ship to Russia. I ship to... Yo, I was shipping to Ukraine and I'm like, what the hell are you doing ordering from Ukraine? I actually asked the person, like the person was like, I ordered, uh, I haven't received anything from you. And I said, where are you? I said, you're Ukraine. Isn't there a war going on? And dude was like, yeah, but we still get mail. <laughs> I was like, really? And then it showed me like, oh, okay. The news is like really interesting. Like nobody knew that like there's actually mail still being delivered in Ukraine. And the only reason why I knew that is because I have customers in Ukraine. So the point of the matter was, was that I developed a way to have an online business to free myself from having to do any labor. So now 
when someone orders from my website, the third party shipping company that I have, and you know, um, I could do a separate about, you know, probably for those people who are interested in entrepreneurship, we'll probably do a separate Zoom and we'll go detailed into this. I have no problem to do that. And I can show you my vendors, I can show you how I do what I do. But essentially, when someone orders, I don't even touch product anymore. So it's manufactured at my factory. It's shipped to my shipping warehouse that's controlled by another company. And they have on my website that whenever an order is made, they get the information right away. They print the labels, they print the product, and they ship it, and they get paid for it. Well, what that allows me to do is to live anywhere I want in the world because I don't have to touch product anymore. I just deal with customer service and then I can just train people to handle my customer service. But because there are health questions being asked most of the time, I do most of the answering myself until I, you know, have sometimes I could have a team do it. But because I have so much time on my hands now, I can take the time to do that and take the time to develop other businesses and do lives like this and do whatever and do a mango farm because I've now freed myself up to have time, which is the most precious commodity on earth. I mean, health is a, is a precious commodity and time is a precious commodity, but you know, health and time go together because the lower your health is, the less time you actually have on this planet. So health is tied into time because you want to be healthy so you have more time. And that's why billionaires are investing in their health because what's the point of having all this money if you can't live to enjoy it and you're unhealthy? So this is why like health is so important for those of us who make money uh, because we're trying to enjoy the fruits of our labor as long as possible. So, you know, I have a lot of wealthy people contacting me all the time about Herbal Results products because they want to live longer and they're focused on it. Whereas, you know, people in the middle class, people who are poor are not so focused on their health because they've got other pressures that they're dealing with in terms of surviving day to day. Right. And there's a whole lot of conversations that go on with that as well. But the point of the matter is and the reason why I told the story is just to give them, give a a, give you a sense of the trajectory of my life and why I be, and how I became financially independent. And it was not something that was overnight. It was through a product. Um, I would say to people that if you are going to do a business, there's two types of businesses. Well, first of all, why do you do business? You do business. So there's wealth and then there's income, right? Those are two separate things. Income has to do with cash flow. Cash flow is necessary to deal with your daily living expenses for you, yourself, your family, and all of that. Your monthly bills and all of that. You've got to have a cash flow that surpasses whatever your monthly bills are. And there's two ways people deal with cash flow, getting a job or starting a business. Getting a job, the problem with getting a job is that you are limited in terms of the income that you can make. Typically, unless you like have a sales commission type of job, which you're kind of running a business in a sense if you're doing sales commission, but most people are doing salary. So you're limited as to how much you can make. You can do as great as possible in your job, be the best person in your job, but you're limited to a certain cap amount of money. Okay. Um, those of us who are not into limitations, we get into business. We get into business because we don't want a cap and we don't like having bosses. Some of us are okay with having bosses, but some of us are very bad soil. I'm a bad soil for someone to be my boss. So I have to be my own boss. And part of it too is I've talked too much shit as a poet to be working for somebody. I've talked about liberation and independence. If you don't have it personally, why are you talking about it for your people? So, I mean, I've, I've, I've trapped myself in a corner where I have no choice to be, but to be my own man because I'm on record for talking too much shit. So the other side of it too, is that my children, I have a son and I don't want my son ever hearing me calling another adult man, my boss. My son knows only, he only knows me to be the boss, like of my household, of everything. I don't report to another man. I don't report to another human being. I don't um, have to ask another human being a, a permission 
to take a vacation. Like that doesn't strike me well. Some people that doesn't bother them. Me, it bothers the hell out of me. And so even if I was to take a job, it would just be as a placeholder to get my foot back into doing my own business. Like it's not a way of life. And it's contingent upon people liking you in a workspace. I can't do that. I can't have whether my family survives based on another man or woman liking me. You understand? Like, I just can't set up my life that way. So um, you get a job or you do a business to solve the cash flow problem because everyone has to solve that problem. People eat every day. People pay expenses every day. All right. Now, in terms of wealth, wealth is gained through using the surplus of your cash flow into investments that yield a return or increase in value over time. So what I did with my excess money from 2000 was put into Bitcoin. And we all know what that's about. Bitcoin is over 72,000 right now. I got into Bitcoin when it was under $200. And I was on Facebook talking about Bitcoin and some people want to argue with me. And this is from 2011 when I read the Bitcoin white paper. I was the main person in Virgin Islands talking about Bitcoin. And I was posting about it all the time because I read the white paper and I also studied economics. So one thing I will say is, is that so um, during my time as a poet, as a poet, you spend a lot of time talking. And you spend a lot of time philosophizing and you talk about politics all the time. So when I had that epiphany, when I got the uh, when I got the uh, when I got malaria and I started having a lucid dream when it said that there's no magic words that's going to solve our problem. Um, it was at that point that I decided that I was going to take a moratorium from for talking about politics for a year. Uh, in other words, I would get into no debates with anyone about history, politics, Pan-Africanism, nothing. I spent the whole year studying money and economics. I studied the Austrian School of Economics. I studied Keynesian economics. I studied Milton Friedman. I studied capitalism. I studied socialism. I studied all of it properly. And I understood the history of money. I understood what money really was. I understood debt. I understood all of these things in a year. This is what I did. I didn't get into any debates with anybody, no arguments about nothing. I just studied money. I didn't want to change your mind on whether you were African or not, whether you were Native American or not, whether you, I didn't get into any of those conversations because what I found out is that if you leave those conversations for a year and you come back, you'll still be in the same sentence. People still be talking about the same thing. You can disappear for a year, improve yourself, and everybody else will still be talking about the same things. You understand what I'm saying? While you have moved on with a different understanding. So that's what I did. I took a year to just blank out everything that I was doing before talking about politics and liberation and, and um activism. And I said, I'm going to study money because money is what's making the world move and business is what's making the world move. And within that, I gained a great education. And I start then understanding the Bitcoin white paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto. And the basic theme is, is that these governments will always print money. And if they're printing money, that means that you're increasing the monetary supply, which means that you're always going to have inflation, which means you're always going to have a devaluing of the currency, which means that if you have something that does not have a devaluing of currency that has a set um, cap to it like Bitcoin has and it has utility and it's also scarce and rare, the price will mathematically go up just based on game theory. And I understood that from 2011 and I, and I read that white paper and it made so much sense to me because I'm coming from Africa where the devaluing of currency is just like the air blowing in the wind. In Jamaica, everyone knows that anyone in Caribbean, when I was in Jamaica, it was like 70. When I was in Jamaica in 2008, uh, it was like 70 Jamaican dollars to one US dollar, even lower than that. Now it's like over 100, which means that you've got to work more hours to buy the exact same thing if you're getting paid the same amount of money. So basically, it's time theft. This is what the devaluing currency does. And actually, you see it in housing prices. 
So if you think about a house, a house just gets older, but why is it the price of the house gets more expensive? Why is an older house becoming more expensive? Like it's not a brand new house, it's an old house. 10 years later, it's gonna be more expensive and it's more broken down, but it's older. Why? Well, it's not because the house got older. It got, not that the house got more valuable, it's that your money got less valuable. So you have to use more money to buy the same thing. That's what happened with the grocery store, right? In 2000, $20, I remember living in South Beach in 1998 and going to the store. $20, I could fill up a cart. Now, $20, you're getting like two, three items and you're done. It is not that these items of food have gotten more valuable. Is because your money has gotten less valuable. So you need more of it to pay for the same thing. This is what you call monetary expansion calling, causing uh, the devaluation of a currency. We see it all the time in developing countries. It just happens slower in the United States, but it happens, right? So um, I put my money into Bitcoin, my surplus money into Bitcoin. So I developed a wealth uh, holdings through that and then also got into Tesla early in 2015 because I saw electric vehicles just made sense. Just like horse and buggies. Like if you knew about horse and buggies and cars, like you have to understand that like during the horse and buggy era, you couldn't live, like living in the city was a very bad thing because all of the roads were full of horse manure and it smelled literally like feces when you lived in the city because they were using horses. So when automobiles came, they became cleaner than and better for the environment, getting you A to B than a horse and buggy. So the horse and buggy industry collapsed when automobiles came, comb uh, internal combustion automobiles. So I see that with the EV industry where, you know, gasoline pollutes, it's dirty. It costs a lot of money to fix uh, engines and all of that and electric vehicles, you don't have an engine. You just have a motor and it requires no maintenance. And I looked at it and I said, wow, so Tesla is going to be a great investment. So I got into Tesla early and I got to Bitcoin early and it all paid off. But I used my um, cash flow for my businesses and I put money aside and I put money into it and it grew. It 10 x for me. Like it, and the, and the people who bought Tesla when I, you know, a few years ago during the pandemic, I did a whole session on investing in Tesla, investing in the stock market. Anyone who invested made 4X their money. Like literally, you made four times your money. Anybody who invested from that date. Um, and anyone who bought Bitcoin from that date too, I think it was Bitcoin was like around 17,000, around 70,000 now. So you did about 4X, 5X. So, um, these things worked out because I understood it and I took the time to understand it. So when we look at business, there's what business does is that business solves the cash flow issue. Investments solve a wealth issue because you accumulate wealth over time through investments. Your business is it's not what you're using for your wealth, even though it is, but business is because there's turnaround of products and services, you're using it for cash flow and then the excess uses to build your wealth base. Right. I need everyone to understand that. That's why people tell me, should I invest in Bitcoin? Should I? Do that? Well, my first thing is, have you solved your cash flow issue? Because if you invest in Bitcoin and you don't solve your cash flow issue, you're going to sell your Bitcoin just to pay your rent. Right. And that's the whole point of it is to hold it for years and decades. Right. And then what wealthy people do is they borrow against their assets. They never sell it. So that's a whole different conversation as well. So. So, for instance, a stock portfolio, you can go to a bank. Every bank has a securities loan depart department. It's a special department. Sometimes you got to call them and make a you got to book a meeting. It's usually a back room of your bank and they'll give you loans based on your stock portfolio. So you don't have to sell your stocks. This is what wealthy people do. You do it with real estate. You can do it with Bitcoin. But that way you never have to sell your underlying asset. And guess what happens when you get a loan on assets? It's tax free. We could talk about that play later. This is what wealthy people do. That'll be in another live that I, I'll show people how that's done. But every bank that you know, like major banks have a securities loans department. And that's what wealthy people do. They get loans against their stocks, particularly in the bull market. So anyway, um, this is all I'm self-taught on all of this because I decided to isolate myself 
from the spinning wheel of just talking about politics and not getting anywhere and talking about what shoulda, coulda, woulda, instead of actually taking agency for myself. You understand what I'm saying? So um, business-wise, a job is just a place filler. The wealthiest people on earth own businesses. So if you want to be in that number, you've got to own a business. All right. Now, the question is, what type of business should you, you be involved in? There's only two types of businesses that exist. I need people to understand this. One business is a service. And the next business is a product-based business. Service-based business is like a dentist, a mechanic, a teacher. It requires you to actually be there. Now you can outsource it to people that you train, but you know, are they going to do it the right way and all that? You know, it's a service-based business. So you've got to actually be there. The problem with a service-based business is, is that it doesn't allow you freedom. You only make money when you're there. A retail business is a service-based business. You're serving customers, even though you're selling products in the store, if you own the store, you've got to keep it open and you're only making money when the doors are open of the, on the brick and mortar business. That's why the internet became such a game changer because people could start making money in their sleep. But most brick and mortar businesses are terrible businesses because the only way you make money is when the doors are open. You want, there's 24 hours in a day you want to make money 24 hours, not eight hours a day. Okay. So the best, the holy grail to business is a product based business because with the product, you're selling that product. And if you have it on the internet, you're selling it 24 hours a day. This is very important. It doesn't require your presence. It doesn't require you to talk to people before you make your money service based business is not the direction that you want to go. A personal trainer is a service-based business. The personal trainer starts making money when they have a product like a DVD or a C something to sell based on their workout routines. But if you've got to be there to train people, you're gonna have a limited income. You're not, you have to start selling T-shirts. You have to start selling training programs, things that you can actually sell, a product based on your brand. Being an artist, that's why being an artist right now, like a musician is perilous because you can't really sell music these days. Everything is in streaming. And so the artist has to actually hit the road to make money from touring. That's terrible. That means the only time you can really make good money is that you gotta be 70 years old playing songs that you wrote you know, in the 1950s, the same songs just to make some money. Because you basically it's a service based business. If you can't sell a product as a musician, as an artist, you've got a big problem because that means you have to be present to make money. You never want to be present as a condition of making money. Remember, I told you that you want to be absent and make money because that's when you will have freedom. And if you get sick, you can't make any money because you can't be present. If I get sick, I can still sell olive leaf bottles. I can still sell herbal results, you know, products. I can still sell the, you know, the things that I have. I can still sell, you know, construction blocks in Gambia. You know what I'm saying? I can still sell whatever I'm doing in other parts of the world. It's always going to be product based. It will never be service based because the service base takes too much out of you and you have to be present. Always remember that if you're going to do a business and you want freedom, you've got to have a product. And when you have a product, you've got to make sure that your product has what is necessary for you to compete on a world level. Um, I've been around a lot of entrepreneurs who have limited themselves because their product labeling is not something. So whenever you make a product, you should ask yourself, like if you're making a juice drink, whatever uh could this product be found could it be in whole foods if the answer is no because the labeling is not up to par then you're doing yourself a disservice 
because what's going to happen because there was people making great products that i saw like you know as an artist and you know people have like pop-up shops and vendors but they will do like products and they'll like literally like have the bottle and the label and they'll be writing what the product is with their hand and like a marker but you might have a great drink but the labeling isn't going to take you anywhere you may have a great drink but you don't have a barcode on it. A barcode is how stores actually keep track of inventory. So you're making it difficult for your product to end up in stores, which is going to give you the financial freedom and the financial uh, wherewithal to have time. You understand what I'm saying? So if you're going to make a product, the first question you got to ask yourself when you sell that product to somebody is, can this product be found in the stores where my biggest competitors are selling at? Could it be right next to them and be sold to? The answer is no, you need to get that product proper. You understand? It's very important because what's all also gonna happen is people aren't gonna take you seriously. They're not going to take your product seriously and you're gonna want people to support you but they'll just be supporting you out of pity. And you will not make money with people supporting you out of pity. Oh, I'll support this person because they're my friend. That doesn't even last. That, that won't last because your friend wants the best product. As much as they love you, they want the best product. And what they mean by best product is they would prefer if your jelly is as good as another jelly, they would probably prefer to get a jelly with a better labeling because it just makes people feel better about themselves to get something that looks good more than supporting you. And that's just what it is. This is just human behavior and human nature. So I, I tell people like, this is very, very important that if you go the product route, which I, I would tell everybody who does business, if you're going to do a service-based business, you better have a product that goes along with it because there's going to be a time where you don't want to show up. There's going to be a time where you don't, you might be sick or you want to travel. Now you have to show up for clients. No, let people buy your product. Let them buy your manual. Let them buy your course. Let them buy whatever. It's like, for instance, with the whole cancer thing, people call me and they say, Haru, do you do consultations? Um, cause I get calls every day and I tell people, yeah, I do consultations and I, I'll do it for free. See my business, not based on consultations, but I tell people before I do a consultation with you, you have to buy the book first. You have to download the cancer book because it tells you step-by-step step everything that you have to do to eradicate your cancer with testimonials from people, with the studies on there, with the places where you can get it. And so you buy that and then we can talk. You understand what I'm saying? Because there's a product associated with my service. And the point of the matter is, is that if you don't have a product with your service, guess what happens? You can't pass down your business to your children. Just because you're a doctor doesn't mean that your child in, in, can, can inherit your medical practice. Just because you're a lawyer and you're giving a service for law doesn't mean your child is going to inherit the legal practice, they can't inherit that because it's a service-based business. But guess what? All my children will be able to inherit my factories and run my factories and run herbal results because it's a product. They don't need any special skills because it's not a service. They don't need any special certification because it's not a service. They literally can graduate high school and start running one of my factories or running one of my products. Do you understand? That's the difference. So I'm thinking about all of this in terms of generational wealth and products are the way to go. But if you're going to do products, make sure that your products compete with the world as a world class product. Get the labeling, get the artwork, get everything done. We can do special sessions on that and how to do that and where to go to get, you know, labels done, where you get the labels printed, you know, who's the third party shipper I use and all of that, how you find contract manufacturers and all that. This is what you have to do. 
There's no way around it. There's no shortcuts. There's no get, get rich quick. There's going to be products you roll out. Some are going to fail. But the point of the matter is you have to get into the business of people gossiping about you in a good way. What do I mean by that? Man, I bought the Herbal Results product and, you know, it's, it, it's, it solved my problem because it's such a great product. Man, I ordered from Herbal Results. I got it so quick. Man, I ordered from, ordered from Herbal Results and the bottle was damaged. Oh, man, you see, you see these black businesses and they're giving you damage. No, 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 no. I didn't finish. I, I contacted them and, and, and told them that the bottle was leaking and they replaced it for me the next day with no questions asked. Oh, damn. You see what I'm saying? You've got to create a situation with your business where the word gets out that it's a pleasure to buy your product, it's a pleasure to deal with you, it's a pleasure. And once you start looking at your customers as sacred, because they are, and this is what's missing in business education, people, people, most business owners are so focused on entitlement. Oh, people need to buy my products. They need to. No, people don't need to do anything for you. You have to be of service to people in terms of what you're giving them. And you have to phrase it in a way of how it's going to improve their lives and why your product is going to do better for them in terms of financially uh, being cheaper or performing better than other products. And that your customer service is on point. If they have a problem, you have an ability to address the problem. And if you do this, if you do those things, you will stand out over other businesses. You will stand out over other businesses. I would also say for people who are, are, are doing product-based businesses, as much as you can, never attach your name to your product. The reason is, is that that imprisons you and it imprisons your product because like I have people buying my product, like I, I, I know that these are like, you know, like I, I'll see their names like like Becky Sue from Alabama. You know what I'm saying? And they don't know they're getting it from a black owned company. You know what I'm saying? And if they did, they probably wouldn't even purchase it from me. Jethro, Billy Bob, you understand what I'm saying? But the product is working for them and they're referring it to their friends. And I don't have to get into a situation where it's called Heru's results and my face is all over the product. And then if I say something that people don't like, now they don't buy my product because they don't like my stance on Africa or they don't like my stance on whatever my stance is about. So I made sure very early that my name is not attached with my company at all or my politics or anything like that because we're out here selling olive leaf. We're out here selling vitamin D. We're out here selling, you know what I'm saying? You don't need to know who, what I think about the US presidential elections as the owner of Herbal Results. You don't need to know what I think about Africa as the future, as the owner of Herbal Results or the owner of you know, any one of the other companies that I might own. Some companies I own and I don't even tell people about it. You know what I'm saying? I don't care about like your religion. Do you want to buy mangoes from my farm or not? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to engage with you about those things. You understand? I engage with people who I want to engage with about things that matter to me because at the end of the day, I'm out here doing business. We're doing business out here. I'm not out here trying to sell my opinions to you because if you really want to know my opinions, you probably won't like me. Really? Because I have a whole different worldview than most people in this country about many different things, many different things. Even Pan-Africanists, I got whole different worldviews than many of them because I see, I just see things differently, but I'm not gonna get into those things and attach it with my product because it doesn't matter. The question is, does it reverse and lower your high blood pressure or not? Does it lower your diabetes or not? Does it get rid of your cancer or not? Does it get away of your kidney failure or not? So that's just what it is. So. I want to lay the framework and I wanted to let people understand that if I've done it, you can do it too. 
I don't consider myself. Some people say, oh, Harold, you're so smart and this and that, blah, 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 blah. No, I'm not. I'm really not. Like, I know really smart people. Like, people I consider smart was like when I was in high school, there was a kid named Matthew Hedrick. Like, he won the science competitions in school. And now he's a um, he, he's a professor, a full professor of uh, theoretical physics specializing in string theory at Princeton University. That guy was smart. <laughs> you understand know what I'm saying? Like, I know geniuses when I see them. Like, I might have certain capacity, but I don't by any means consider myself a very smart person. I think that I have average intelligence. I think the difference is, is that I have focus. Like, I'm able to focus. Like, it, it could be an earthquake going around me, but if I need to focus on something, I'll focus on it and won't let the earthquake distract me. I think that's the special skill that I have, not like any special intelligence because i've been around people who i consider like really intelligent like especially physicists you know what i'm saying when they start talking i gotta shut up and start taking notes because they start talking about all types of spatial geometry and all types of things that i just haven't quite grasped yet and even right now i'm still trying to read isaac newton's books like i have it with me i'm reading isaac newton's books because i want to brush up on i mean this guy and he invented calculus on his summer break because there was a spot, there was a smallpox outbreak. And so he was sent home and he invented calculus, y'all, like derivative mathematics. I mean, it's crazy. So these are the people I consider geniuses, like people who built the pyramids, like being able to build like 3.2, 2.3 million blocks, and each block weighs like four to eight tons. How do you do that and align it with true north? Like that's crazy to me. You understand what I'm saying? That people were able to do that. I don't think I have that ability. That's what I consider geniuses. So for me, I'm thinking like, yo, these are just basic things that if people just follow these formulas, anybody with average intelligence. And here's the other thing. Because of my life trajectory and my, where my life has gone, y'all, I've had the opportunity to hang out with folks from the hood who ain't got a pot to piss in, and I'm comfortable with them. And we can shoot dice, we can talk rap music, we can talk hood shit. Like I'm very comfortable in those environments worldwide, whether I'm in Lagos, whether I'm in Chicago, whether I'm in New York, whether I'm in uh, Kingston and I'm in the garrisons, I'm comfortable in those places, yo. I'm comfortable around gunmen and all of that. I've been around that, but I'm also comfortable around billionaires. I've had an opportunity to have lunch and dinner with literally people who are billionaires. And what I found out is these billionaires are not more intelligent than cats from the hood. They're not. And the reason, this is, here's the test. The way you test someone's intelligence is you don't ask them about the field that they're in because they're going to have more experience than you in that field if you're not in that field. The way you, this is the way I test intelligence. This works all the time. You talk about something you mutually know about and you ask that person about that thing that you mutually know about and listen to how they approach it and what they say about it. And if they say something brilliant or they give you a different way to think about that thing that you both know about, that's a truly brilliant person. But if they analyze this thing that you both know about, I don't care what it be, like it could be about anything, it could be about music, it could be about anything but it has to be something that you mutually know about and you ask that person what they think about it and how they approach it and if they sound stupid about that thing that they know about and you know about then this is not a particularly intelligent person this is a person who's gotten experience and opportunities that you haven't got gotten and what i've realized about a lot of billionaires they do not have any special aptitude that you have or millionaires or multimillionaires, they just got opportunity in a place and they had no disasters happen for strings of years and they were able to make this thing work using average intelligence. You understand? There were certain things that they might have known about in terms of financing and that you didn't know, know about, but if you took time to get to know about it, like it's the difference between how Trump was able to raise money and how the average person raises money. Like it's clear that Trump is not the, the the brightest bulb in the room. When you hear him talk about foreign policy, he doesn't even know 
Like he, he, he doesn't even know different countries. Like you can hear him winging it. Like I know when someone's winging it because I went to school with bullshitters, right? I went to school with like rich white boys who were bullshitters. You understand what I'm saying? When I went to private school, University of Chicago, like I know who's a bullshitter. And I went to like a private university with people from like wealthy families. And a lot of them are just bullshitters. And you know when someone's bullshitting. I'm so familiar with a character like Donald Trump. Like I know them like the back of my hand. And I laugh because I, I know when he's winging it and making shit up. You understand what I'm saying? And Donald Trump needs $400 million to appeal a case. And he ain't got it because most of his money's tied up in his real estate that's already leveraged. So he can't, he's not liquid $400 million. He can't get it because most of his properties are already mortgaged. So he can't even get a second, third mortgage on. He's got all, and he got bankruptcies and all types of stuff. So he can't get the $400 million. So guess what Mike, what Donald Trump does? He does what wealthy people, it's a wealthy person's uh, GoFundMe. You know what that's called? It's called an IPO. <laughs> yeah, an IPO. This is what wealthy people do. You get a SPAC, which is a special purpose acquisition company that's already got some history as a public company. You get it to merge with your private company. So you get that history. And so because he got kicked off of Twitter, he started a thing called True Social, which he's the main old, o owner of. And they say you need $400 million or we can't go through the appeal of this case. And he needed it in 48 hours. And in 48 hours, he did a public listing of Truth Social through a reverse merger with a SPAC and did an IPO. And his wealth increased from Friday to that Monday, which was like two weeks ago or last week, $6 billion. Trump increased his wealth by $6 billion by basically doing a rich man's GoFundMe. See, when middle class and poor people get broke, they do GoFundMes. When wealthy people go broke, they just do IPOs. This is just what it is. And so what I'm saying is, is that you can get mad, you can get, or understand it and try to use it for ourselves and our families. This is real. You understand what I'm saying? At some point, I might go public with herbal, herbal results. In some of my other companies, I might go public and raise a quick couple billion dollars, depending on what it is. You understand what I'm saying? Because I know that, you know, with a couple billion, I could do a lot for Africa. But what I'm saying is, it's like, you can get upset, but what you need to do is you need to understand what people are doing and what could be available to you for you to do. And this is important. Everyone's, you see, you live in a society that doesn't tell you how to thrive. They don't tell you how to thrive health-wise. Like you have the pandemic, they told you nothing about vitamin D. They told people to stay indoors when you should have been outdoors getting vitamin D because it turns out that vitamin D is responsible for handling inflammation of the lungs <laughs> and opportunistic infections. Everyone should have been taking high dose of vitamin D during the pandemic. But, you know, I tried to tell people, you know what I'm saying? But it's not like I have a megaphone and people want to listen to Fauci instead because, you know, he's seen as the authority. Like, I definitely, I mean, I, I knew Pan-Africanists who were definitely riding around on some trust Fauci type vibes because people were scared and they were part of the Democratic Party because they hated Trump. You know, it's like Pan-Africanists, real Pan-Africanists were on that type of time. Like, this is real. And they were arguing with me about hydroxychloroquine, but I had done the research. But they were just so anti-Trump that they accepted anything the Democratic Party put out. We could talk about American politics later, but I'm just telling y'all right now because I'm back and forth for Africa. I don't even care about American politics, but I understand what's going on. I try to keep tuned what's going on, and it's mostly a joke. It's mostly a joke. I mean, if they're telling you that the only two people you can vote for is Biden, who's literally a living ancestor, like Biden is literally half dead. He's a living ancestor right now for, for like the Caucasian population. He's a living ancestor who can't like function properly. It's clear. It's clear the man has type three diabetes, which is dementia, Alzheimer's. It's, it's called type three diabetes. And then, and then you uh, have Donald Trump 
who's just basically a narcissist. You understand what I'm saying? These are the two best people that the United States can offer. That's the two best people that the United States can offer because you have two different political parties. And then maybe you have Robert F. Kennedy, who he, he, he talks that shit. He, he's been against the whole vaccines and all of that. He, you know, like if I was, if out of those three, like he's, he's the only one who's actually saying things that actually can be verified. You know what I'm saying? Like, but they're gonna try to, you know, ruin his name. Like they actually want him to be killed. Like Biden won't even give him secret service. And he's from the Kennedy family who has like, there's a habit of assassinating them. You know what I'm saying? And he can't even get secret service. That's crazy. It's just funny. Like I'm watching this from a distance and I'm saying America, like the best people that you can actually put out in front of these two people. This is the best that you got to offer. You, you, you can't get anywhere as a country. If those are the people pressing the buttons, but it's not really them pressing the buttons. So it's just like, it is what it is. So you, you might, you might want to start looking at Africa for, you know, a way out because America, like if these are your two options, it's going to be a shit show. And this is the perfect time to go develop in Africa because if we're talking about entrepreneurship, Africa is the place to be because Africa right now in terms of how Africa is under construction, Africa is like investing in Africa is like investing in Amazon in 2000. Early stage stock. That's where Africa is at right now. And there's a lot going on. We'll do a special live on Africa and all of that. But I just wanted to give people a little background because I know people watch this. And some people came live and watched it. Some people are going to tune into this later on. Uh, because what I want to be able to do for the listening audience is this thing grows is I want to be able to provide real solutions. Like, I don't want to just give my opinions on politics and this and that, even though I will from time to time, but I want to get into like real solutions. Like, Hey, Haru, uh, I've got epileptic seizures. What can I do? I can tell you exactly what to do. Like, Oh, Hey, Haru, I've got kidney failure. Hey, Haru, I've got stage three prostate cancer. Like, do you have experience with reverse? Yes, I can tell you. Hey, Haru, I need to start my business. Like, this is my business idea. What do you think about it? I can tell you because I've been able to walk that path. And so I want this to be more solutionary. Um, sure, it'll be entertaining because I got a bag of stories. I mean, the, look, man, my life, I've met the most amazing interesting, funny, beautiful people in my life and my travels that I've got so many damn stories that I can share that if it was in a movie, you wouldn't even believe it. You understand what I'm saying? Like, you know, I, I want to be able to share the stories with people because I get a lot of inboxes. People ask me a lot of questions, man. And I gladly answer. People think they're bothering me. You're really not bothering me because I solved my time problem. So like I might answer 50 inboxes a day. And I'll answer everybody. I think everyone knows that. Anyone who's tuned in right now, you, if you sent me a text message or inbox, nine times out of 10, I answer. If I didn't answer you, it's because I missed it because I'm getting so many messages and I just couldn't keep up with it. But I mean, I have a lot of stories to share and like a lot of information to give people because I've just lived, I've lived a great life, man. I've received a lot of love. Like I've received a lot of love in my life, man. I was loved by my parents. I've had great relationships with women. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like I've lived a, a you know, I've had great male friends, I've brethren, like I've traveled, I've seen a lot. So I love to give the love back because it's easy for me to give the love back because I've had so much love poured into me. You understand what I'm saying? So it's nothing for me to pour it back to people who want to seek better for their lives and want to avoid some of the pitfalls that are out there. So I like to make myself available. And a lot of people have hit me up saying, Haru, could you just please make yourself more available? Um, can you be a mentor to my children? Could you be a mentor to me? Can you do this? And I feel like the live can do that. But what I want to do is just let people understand my story a little bit more. So you understand my worldview, my context, my personality a little bit more. Because some people have never even met me. Some people have never even heard me speak. They just see my posts on Facebook or wherever. 
and they say, oh, I like what you're saying, but they don't know where I'm coming from. They don't know why I say what I say. And some people get confused and they need a lot more context. So that's what I'm doing here. But what I want to be able to do is like if people got questions about business, what will be great is the next live. I'm going to do a live tomorrow. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to do a live Monday through Thursday. Now, most people say the evenings is best for them. I'm going to try to do the evenings, but I might do the daytime sometimes as well. And I know people are free. Don't tell me you ain't free because I see y'all on Facebook in the afternoon in the morning when you're supposed to be at work. So I know y'all got time. So, <laughs> so I know what it is. Uh, I'm going to do some in the afternoon because my afternoons and mornings are free because I work when I want. So I'm going to do some, you know, from the mango orchard, man. Y'all can, you know, ask me anything y'all want about mangoes and what have you. And um, what I'd like to do, particularly for the entrepreneurs who are tuned in, when we start, maybe like Mondays will be like Money Mondays and Tuesdays will be like something Tuesday. I don't know. We'll figure something out. But what I'd like to do, we can form community, man, in the sense of I'm going to have people come on live, right? And you got a business idea. Pitch the business idea. I'm going to ask you questions. And what, what happens is, is that we're able to now help each other because we're your consumers. Like, you show me your label. Show the group, your la like the, the, the people in the lab. Oh, this is the label I'm thinking. People can critique it and say, I think that color would be better. Remember, these are going to be your consumers. So what we're able to do is we're able to strengthen each other with conversation meaningful conversation like we're not going to be wasting our time talking about celebrities unless we're going to just be clowning them for whatever reason like you know that's fun too but what i'm saying is, is like we got to do things that are programmatic because these celebrities are usually people with more money than you and you don't need to be focused on you know people who got more money than you without getting your money together right that's why i'm not into like watching sports because you know i'm not into watching like millionaires play for billionaires if i ain't got millions of dollars too and i've done well for myself so i'm i'm, I'm fine i can do that but at the same time i've outgrown certain things so for me i'm interested in learning more so like anything i can learn i you know take my time and learn and quiet is kept if you lock everything out because of YouTube and what's available, you can learn something in two weeks and know it better than 90% of the population. I promise you. When I started learning about Bitcoin, my wife will tell you, I didn't do anything for two weeks, but just study Bitcoin. Two weeks, then I understood it. Like anything that I've wanted, like mangoes, like growing mangoes. Like it's not what you think. Like a lot of things that you think you know through like osmosis, most people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> like they really don't know what they're talking about. Like even growing fruit trees, most people don't know. People think grafted fruit trees are like GMO. They don't know what even grafting means. They like the people, like the average person knows very little. That's why they don't have much results in their life because the educational system doesn't really teach you anything. People don't know anything about like plants, really, like really know about plants because most people don't grow plants. So they don't even know, they don't even know like fertilizer and like the whole thing about organic and like how it's like really kind of a fraud. Like they don't like, they don't know because they don't need to know because they just go to the grocery store and get whatever. And they're just following whatever other people say because they don't have any hands-on experience doing things. You understand what I'm saying? So what I found out is that if you get hands-on experience and you focus on something very deeply, I've, I've, I read this a long time ago, that if you love something enough and are dedicated to it enough, it will reveal all of its secrets to you. Most of us don't have enough love or dedication to a thing, so we haven't had it reveal its secrets to you. Like if you are really in love with music and you're dedicated to learning music, the secrets of music will be revealed to you. If you love the human body and health enough, the secrets of the human body and health will be revealed to you based on your level of zeal. If you love a woman enough as a man and you're dedicated to her enough, she will reveal all of her secrets to you. If you love money and wealth enough, money and wealth will reveal all of its secrets 
to you. And that's the difference is, is that I don't learn and know things based on whispers. I deal with it based on passion, zeal, time, dedication, and love. That's why I've been able to master herbs. I've been able to master health. I've been able to master finance. I've been able to master poetry. I've been able to master all law, all different things in life. And not because I'm a genius. It's because I've just had love and dedication for that thing. And a lot of times, quiet is kept. Sometimes it's just two weeks of love and focus. I'm telling you, if you, anything, I'm telling you right now, anything that you're interested in, if you lock everything out for two weeks and go on YouTube and listen to lectures and listen to people who've been successful in that thing, like really, like right now, one of my passions is I'm into like um, to physics. One of the reasons is because I failed physics when I was in college and it turned out that my teachers were bad. I've taught myself, retaught myself physics. But when you start learning physics now, you start to find out that there's a civil war going on in the physics community between string theorists and everybody else. And it's fascinating that when you get into that world and you start listening to it, like it reveals all of its secrets to you. Like there's a there's a civil war going on in the physics community, if y'all don't know it. And you you probably should because physics is in control of like all technology is based on physics. And it's important for African people to really get into physics. Like we have all these people focus on metaphysics, but um, to me, my my like I'm more impressed by people who like really understand physics because that's what puts rockets into space. That's what allow Elon Musk to actually land rockets back. Like a lot of people don't know, like like a lot of people don't know that Elon Musk like. The hugest thing that he did was not like Tesla and electric vehicles. He solved the rocket problem. See, the problem with space travel was is that rockets were not reusable. So it cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build a rocket, but you could only use it one time. You shoot it to space and it's spent and it's gone. And it's like, imagine if airplane travel from New York to LA, you could only use the plane once. The price of air travel would be very expensive if you could not reuse planes over and over again. So based on first principles thinking, Elon Musk said, we're not doing anything in space business, space travel, nothing until we solve the reusable rocket issue, until we can reuse rockets. So guess what he did? He spent the first 10 years of SpaceX trying to shoot rockets to space and land them back on Earth, which NASA was not able to do. And NASA, by the way, is really funded by German uh, Nazis, <laughs> you know, like real Nazis, like the whole NASA program. When you go to when you go to Washington, D.C., Virginia area, you got like buildings, NASA buildings like von Stubenberg uh, building or whatever. These are all like Nazis. It's called Operation Paperclip. They took the Nazis from World War Two who were like they said, slaughtering all the Jews and all of that that were enemies and and brought them to um United States to work for NASA and treated them very well. Actually, the, the head of NASA was a Nazi called Warner Von Braun, like a real Nazi. I'm not talking about like a skinhead Nazi, like what you see Nazi today. I'm talking about like a card carrying Heil Hitler with pictures with like him his arm around Adolf Hitler and like he'll hear like Heil, he'll just go like that. <laughs> like it's just a reflex. You understand what I'm saying? And the way you see those Nazis, they would have like fencing scars because they would have duels. This is one of the ways, like in German aristocratic, aristocratic societies, they would duel. They would have dueling going on. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, exactly. Dulles flew them in. It's called Operation Paperclip. Took them because he didn't want the Russians, Russians to get them, and they brought them to the United States. And Werner von Braun was a master of rocket science in Germany for the Nazis. And he came to the United States and headed the NASA program for space, the space program. And they have buildings named after him, a Nazi. And as a matter of fact, when you get a naturalized United States, like you're an immigrant, one of the, the questions they ask you in naturalization is, have you ever been a member of the Nazi party? <laughs> they actually ask you that. 
That, that is on the application to become a citizen of the United States. And it turns out the Nazis are responsible for the NASA program. This is what I'm talking about, power, y'all. Warner Von Braun wasn't begging these people. He said, I got some information that, you know, that's real powerful. And so you either going to deal with me or not. He didn't go through the Nuremberg trials. He went straight to Washington, D.C. with a bungalow for him and his, his children. <laughs> Warner Von Braun is his name. Look him up. A real Nazi. Science and technology rules, y'all. Like, science and technology is the great equalizer. And if those people who do not master science and technology will always be the slaves of people who master. They'll always be the slaves to people who master science and technology. And this is real. Like, we have to get serious as a people. This is why, like, Kwame Nkrumah, this is why Kwame Nkrumah and Ghana got overthrown, because this whole thing was like, look, Ghana being independent means nothing unless the rest of Africa has independence and we're united because Ghana can't become a world power. We just don't have the population. We don't have the resources, but Africa does. And Nkrumah started working on atomic science. And there's a place in Ghana till this day. It's an area in Ghana. It's like a village and it's called Atomic. And their building called the Atomic Research Laboratory Center in Ghana that Kwame Nkrumah started and he was a black American scientist over to Ghana, giving him a house, giving him a car to work on atomic energy for, for Africa. And he got overthrown. And his story is crazy how he got overthrown. He went, he got overthrown. They couldn't overthrow Nkrumah when he was in Ghana. He had to leave Ghana and they overthrew him. And they gave a guy named Kota Ka, which the airport in Ghana is named after, which should not be named after him. Kota Ka was a general who overthrew Nkrumah for $10,000 by the CIA. And guess where Nkrumah went? Nkrumah went to Vietnam. You know why he went to Vietnam? Because he went to Vietnam to help settle the dispute that the United States government was having with his homie, Ho Chi Minh. Why was Ho Chi Minh his homie? Because they were both students in London at the same time working as students when no one knew who they were. They were working as dishwashers for a hotel in London. And they were young boys, students. And they used to talk about how they were going to go home to their countries that had been colonized by these people. And they were going to go and lead their countries to freedom. And so Kwame Nkrumah, his homie, they used to wash dishes with him, his homie, His homie Ho ends up becoming the head of Vietnam and Nkrumah ends up becoming the head of Ghana. And so when his homie Ho needed some pride, Nkrumah went to go to Vietnam to go chill with his homie Ho to go deal with what was happening. And when he left, that's when they overthrew Nkrumah. But Nkrumah was building the Atomic Laboratory Research Center for Africa so that we could actually get into this game of technological power. It's deep. I mean, I got a million stories that I could tell you, but the point of the matter is, is that everything is based on who has power and who doesn't. And you can talk as much as you want to talk, but it's about bully politics. At the end of the day, as the bully said in school, can you kick my ass? Sounds good, but can you kick my ass though? And if we can't do it, we're going to be relegated to marching, signing petitions, Begging for this, begging for that to be treated fairly in an unfair world. Go tell the gazelle who's running for their life that the lion should be fair to them and see what the lion's going to say about that. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? That's not the way the world works. It's the law of the jungle. And until we understand that, that this jungle is a technological jungle that is run by scientists, engineering, and manufacturing, we're going to be relegated to being prisoners of war. And that's just the reality of the situation until our people take this thing seriously. But very fortunately, we've got a 
what they call a trump card, no pun intended. We've got Africa, which is the most valuable piece of real estate on earth. And it turns out that most of the minerals that the world needs to operate comes from Africa. So therefore, if Africa ever gets its act together with manufacturing and science and technology as creators and innovators, that our children have a task of doing every black person on earth, just like every Muslim person on earth, their goal is to one day go to Mecca, Every black person on earth, our goal should be to develop manufacturing in Africa as a religious requirement. Because that's the only way we get out of this problem. Just like, you know, like groups of people, they have their requirements, like Jewish people, like you must marry a Jew. Like no one says that's racist. That's just part of it. Like a Jewish girl knows she got to marry a Jewish boy. I went to school with them, so I know. I know how it goes. They can tell you how fair and how unracist and whatever they are, but when it comes to the Jews preserving their lineage and who they are, they're not negotiating with you about it. And what I'm saying is, it's like, um, let's stop worrying what other people say, what are we doing? And it just so that we were gifted by the creator with the most valuable piece of real estate on earth, which is the African continent. And I'm gonna end this stream with a quote from a song called the book of rules i probably can't play it because they're gonna play or hate on me and they're going to um they're going to uh probably block it on facebook but let me see if i can find the quote somewhere i don't want to do it any misjustice but um i want you all to take this quote to heart before i get off um, I'm gonna try to find it if I can find it, but it's a very important quote that everybody should really take heed to. And if anyone got any questions, go ahead and ask the questions, uh, and I'll try to answer you with any questions that you have. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, and the next ones, you know, people can come on and start talking and we can start chopping it up. Any questions you have, I think it'll be instructive because a lot of questions I get in my inbox, the answers I give are answers that a lot of people could benefit from as well. So I just want to make this more like a community thing where people can like learn together. Um, I do not see. All right. Hold on. I want to give you all a quote because it's very profound. Uh, it's sung by the Heptones, but it's a poem uh, called The Book of Rules. And I'm just going to get the lyrics real quick. And I want to close out with that. I even, you know, we went on longer than I wanted to. Okay, here we are. All right. All right, here we go. So it says, each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass in the book of rules. Now, at first glance, that might not seem, that might not seem profound to you, but it's actually extremely profound. Each is given a bag of tools. The bag of tools are the personal gifts that you've been endowed by your by the creator. Each is given a bag of tools. Some of us can sing. Some of us are good at math. Some of us are good at human relationships. Some of us are good at public speaking. Some of us are good. It is your responsibility to find what is the bag of tools that you've been given? And what's the bag of tools that your children have been given? The second part is, listen what they say. Each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass in a book of rules. The shapeless mass is the unrealized potential That unrealized potential is what you do 
with the bag of tools. That's the shapeless mass. So you're given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and the third thing you're given is a book of rules. Everything in earth has a rule set. Gravity is a rule set. Electricity has a rule set. Solar energy has a rule set. Motion has a real rule set. Health has a rule set. Herbs have a rule set. Money has a rule set. There's a book of rules that goes along with everything. The person you become is the person who identifies, or the best person that you become is the person who identifies what their bag of tools is. And that bag of tools is usually identified by what people compliment you on without you soliciting them for any type of suggestions. In other words, someone says, damn, you sound real good when you sing, right? That's unsolicited. Damn, you speak real well. You use words real well. You write real well. Oh, you do math real well. Oh, man, you really, you really conduct business really well. That's your bag of tools. The shapeless mass is the effort, the zeal, or lack thereof that you have towards that bag of tools. And the book of rules is the rule set, the preordained rules that is up to you to find out, like the rules of money, why Bitcoin makes sense over fiat, why electric vehicles will rule over internal combustion vehicles. There are a book of rules in terms of how technology progresses, why you can now start picking stocks that make sense. Like, of course, Amazon is going to do well over a box, um, a, a retail store, because people are going to find it more convenient to have things delivered to their door. If you start thinking about it, it just starts making more sense. And so if you were an early investor in Amazon, you would have understood that book of rules of investment. Human relationships between husband and wife have a has its own rule set that has worked for millions of years. The relationship between mother and child, the relationship between father and child, there's a rule set that goes along with it. There's a rule set that goes on between men. How do men develop a healthy fear of each other so that we don't violate each other and get into violence? Because that's how men solve their problems is through violence ultimately. And how do we prevent that from happening? There's rule sets that happen and that you know and take place. And if you don't understand those rule sets, you will be diminished as a person. So that's why that quote is so important. Everybody has been given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules. What is your bag of tools? How are you dealing with the shapeless mass in terms of your zeal and your effort? And what is your understanding of the book of rules that govern the shapeless mass in the book of in, in the bag of tools? So I'm gonna end with that. But um, people got questions. I'm gonna answer a few questions. Um, vitamin D. Vitamin D will be. I'm working on uh, different suppliers for the vitamin D. Hopefully it'll be available by sometime in uh, May. Someone asked about the maximum strength olive leaf extract that'll be available at the end of this month. I'm doing a production run. Once I put out the cancer eradication book, a lot of people started buying the olive leaf extract and the vitamin D, and so we sold out faster than we usually do. So I had to go ahead and um, do a bigger production run. So the super strength is available. You would just take double that to, in, to get the same uh, potency as the maximum strength. But a lot of people want that as well. Yes, the olive leaf can benefit edema. The edema is just dealing with swelling. Um, and so that is inflammatory based. And so I would definitely try the olive leaf. Uh, access to berberine from India. Uh, I don't know if it's from India, but there's a berberine brand that I use that's pretty good. Um,
I use it as well, particularly during mango season to keep my blood sugar low. Uh, can y'all hear me now? Can you hear me now? Um, I'm not sure if this is from China or not. I can look into it, but it works pretty well. Um, and there's another berberine that I use too, and it has a black cover. Um, I forgot the name of that com that company, but you can inbox me and I can tell you about that as well. Um, this brand name is called, I think this one might be from China. It's called Zoo. This isn't the main one I use. I use another one from another company. It's black. Um, I'll just have to find it and I can give you the link to that and you can see if it's from China or not. But I know that that, um, that berberine worked very well. I definitely take it during, I take it along with the olive leaf to keep my blood sugar low during uh, mango season, just to, you know, make sure that my blood sugar doesn't uh, go out of whack. Um, let's see if, now I, I'd have to look online again for the berberine. I can't find where it is, but um, I could definitely give you a link to that berberine. It works very well. Um, I can definitely recommend it to you. I just would have to take some time to look for it. I haven't ordered it. I usually order it during the mango season. So um, I haven't had an opportunity to look. Um, anybody else got any questions? Hopefully this was an informative session, y'all. Um, I don't want to do all the talking in the sessions. Uh, people can, but we needed to lay a little groundwork and uh, some foundation to what was being said so you can understand where I'm coming from, y'all. But um, if you found this thing to be uh, favorable and empowering, you can hit the cash app if you want. You don't have to, but I believe in reciprocity. And so if you got something out of it uh, and you feel like it's something that you want to give energy to in terms of financial energy, in terms of energy back, you can go ahead. The cash app is going is running down here. Um, usually what i find is is that um when i give these types of conversations i get cash apps from people in different places and they'll ask me where my cash app is because it helped them um through some of the youtube uh, videos uh like some of the like <laughs> I, I told people about tesla four years ago and I, there's a guy who made about uh, fifty thousand dollars profit off of tesla and he wanted to he wanted to send me five thousand dollars as like a ten percent tithing because he made so much money from the Tesla investment. So he, you know, he was asking me like, you know, can I send you cash out? And I was like, nah, you ain't got to do all of that. But, you know, there's some people like that. So um, I had a good time talking to y'all. I don't necessarily like monologuing all the way through. I can't believe it's been a couple of hours. It's three and a half hours that we've been on. So, um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Um, any business questions? I think tomorrow we can go over business as well. Those who want to ask questions about business, tomorrow would be a good time because what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the floor and um, back on tomorrow at 8 p.m. And uh, so, you know, we have a sister Zakia Days. I believe you ordered mangoes from the orchard last year. Um, if you got questions, so yeah. So tomorrow, um, I'll be pinning the call in where you can come on live with me. We can have a conversation. You can ask questions, and people can listen to the conversation. If people want to be part of the conversation, they can join in as well. I'll be pinning the uh, place where you can call in. Um, I'd like people to be camera ready because I don't like to speak to people I can't see. Um, what social media has done is it's kind of alienated us, us from each other, where we're just images to each other. And I'd like to have more of a human relationship with the people who I'm talking to. Um, it is a stream yard. So all I do is just I'll send the link. I'll pin the link on Facebook and YouTube and on Twitter. And anyone who just calls in, you'll be able to come live with me, ask me any questions. And then people in the audience can tune it, can, um, can chime in because... What I found is most of the questions that most people want to ask are questions that other people want to ask. And then the answers become very informative and very, very um, helpful to people. But if you're camera shy, 
you know, we may make a exception where you can just come on, you can use your voice, but I do prefer to see people. And the reason is, is that I'd like to see you because, I mean, I'm, I might be at the airport and see you, you know, and at least we can meet instead of just being Facebook friends and we don't know each other. And because I've been in the public eye for so long, I have, you know, whenever I travel, I go in the airport and be, hey, are you Haru? And I'm not even a celebrity like that. But the problem is, is that, you know, it's kind of weird when people know who you are and you don't know who they are. And it's just nice to be able to identify people because it's like, man, we've been Facebook friends for 10 years, 15 years, and we've never met. So it'd be nice that like we know each other, you know, at least visually. It's just a human thing that is actually very recent where we don't know each other in terms of our human appearance. And we just know each other through our avatars and it, it starts becoming kind of weird, right? Um, that's not the type of direction we want life to go. We want to be able to have human experiences with each other. So that's why I would ask people, just be camera ready. Don't worry. Ain't nobody trying to judge how you look. This ain't one of those type of things, man. Um, you know, everybody's beautiful. You're just trying to get some information to make your life better, whether it's health, economics, or relationships, whatever you want to ask me. But just go on here and it's just, you know, as you can see, most people tune in are very loving people. They just, people just trying to work it out. People just trying to get a solution to, you know, making the next breakthrough financially or business wise, entrepreneurial wise or health wise. And that's what this is about. You know, we'll talk about other things as well. Talk about a little history. I'll break down little things as well. But um, there's a great community of people that is on my friends list. Um, very, very accomplished people in their own ways. And it's just great that we all can meet each other through this medium. So, um, you know, I'm very happy for the people who tuned in. I hope that this was helpful to people. I had a lot of fun talking. Um, but, you know, next next show that we do, uh, you know, I want to get more of you all involved, you know. So it, it is what it is, man. So I had a good time. Just remember, everybody has been given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules. And ponder on that. For yourself and and, and and i'm gonna close with this every three months for the last year or so i do a four-day water fast to recalibrate my health because after three days of fasting we can talk about this next time you get a whole new immune system after three days of fasting like a water fast no food um but what I also do is I, I do inventory of myself. Like it's important to do self audit. Like brutally honest. Like are you are you really using your time well? Are you sleeping well? That's important. Like if you're not sleeping well, you need to solve that problem. Most people are miserable because they don't sleep well. Are you um How's your diet? How's your exercise regimen? How's your relationships? How are you doing business-wise? Are you doing everything you need to do for your business? Are you marketing it properly? Are you doing? It's important. You see, what industrial society and fast-paced society does, it doesn't give us time to actually sit down and do personal audits. That's what these whole nine to fives are. They take away your time for yourself to actually do reflection because you're just trying to wake up to make it to the next day. Well, fortunately, I've been able to have time to think. And every couple months or so, I'll take a long time to just think about myself, what I've done, what I can do better, and be brutally honest. And the other thing that I would ask you all to do, and I'll talk about it tomorrow, is I believe in intentional happiness. So all of you, no, no coconut water. It's plain water, and you maybe you can add um, lime, fresh squeezed lime in there as well. It's a cheat code. It makes the water a little bit more pleasurable to drink, but it's not adding any calories. It doesn't throw you off your fast. Coconut water will throw you off your fast because it has calories and actually has sugar. I mean, natural sugars, but it'll throw you off of your fast. So you need to use just water. You can add lime. Um, I would just say an ending. Everybody should do an audit of themselves in terms of intentional happiness. Because what we find out is, is that most people are happy accidentally. 
What I mean is like something might happen today and it might make you happy. But I'm smiling all the time because I know what makes me happy. Like I have about five or six things that are indispensable to my happiness. So what I do is I make a list and I would advise everyone to make a list. Make a list of things or activities that are indispensable to your happiness. Like mine is roots reggae music. I have to have roots reggae music. If I don't listen to roots reggae music, like that's part of me and me being happy. Like mangoes is part of my indispensable happiness. Doing business, entrepreneurial business, Pan-African activities, that's indispensable to me. Like I have a couple more things that are indispensable. And so, because I know that that's indispensable to my personality being happy, and it should be things that don't require other people, by the way, because then you then make other people responsible for your happiness, which you should never, ever do. Never make other people responsible for your happiness because you will always be disappointed. Figure out what makes you happy and things that you can do on your own, irrespective of other people's participation. You make that list and you make sure that you intentionally engage in at least two items from that list every day and you will be a happy person or a happier person because now you are intentionally engaged in happiness instead of accidentally being happy these are things that people don't do because i've actually sat down with people and I've asked them what are the things that are indispensable to your happiness and they'll say, I've never been asked that question before. I've never thought about it. And they don't even know. And they have to do soul searching, which tells me that this person has not had even the quiet time to reflect, to get to know themselves. So how can someone make you happy if you don't even know what makes you happy? Do you understand? So these are ways that you can reverse engineer happiness. Intentional happiness. Make a list, y'all. So we can talk about that tomorrow. Like I know my list, <laughs> I know it like the back of my hand and I engage in all of those things all the time. So um, I'm gonna leave y'all with that. So I just wanna thank y'all for tuning in. Uh, visit the sponsor herbalresults.net for any health needs you need. We have studies on there. We have testimonials on there for all different types of illnesses ranging from cancer to high blood pressure to um, diabetes to kidney failure to epileptic seizures to infections and what have you. People tell their stories and show you how the products work. Um, there's no reason why anyone should be sick with any of these things called metabolic disorders. From time to time, I'll be doing uh, lives just on health because without your health, life isn't worth living. So we want to make sure that we basically dot all our I's and cross our T's that we cover all the bases in terms of what a human being needs to live, thrive, and be happy because this society sure ain't teaching you that. All right. So um, yeah, the sister says, Sister Ami, she says, studying our true story, learning in general, music, studying health, business, and nature. And so you got to make sure, Ami, that you engage in at least two of those things every day so that you can maintain your happiness. Because what you're going to find out is that if you don't engage in those things, it's going to be a reflection of how miserable you actually are. And when you inject those things into your daily activity now, you find yourself more pleasant, happier, sense of purpose, and your relationships end up being a lot better with other human beings because you yourself are happy. And you're not waiting for other people to make you happy. So it's good that you know what yours are, you know? Um, what book I would recommend on personal development. Um, there's all types of books on personal development. I've never actually read books on personal development. I've read books on how to do things, how to get things done. Um, but I do think that a starter for your own personal development in terms of like the personal human being, you need to understand what makes you happy because being happy is going to change your approach to any other things in life, right? It's gonna change your approach to your human relationships. It's gonna change your approach to business. It's gonna change your approach to working. You're gonna change your approach to your children, to your um, love interests, all of that. So I would say first, the first thing you need to do is do an audit of your personality and yourself and what do you need to make you happy? Or in other words, what if it was absent from your life 
you would not be happy, right? Because so like if reggae music never existed in my life from this day forward, I would not be a happy person. If I was forced to listen to other music besides reggae music, like roots reggae music, I would not be a happy camper. I know that I'd be miserable. So I know that that's part of my indispensable list. And so I'm just saying that like, you need to know what those things are. And then you need to start making divisions. Like there's a way of doing it. And I could probably break it down next time, but the things that make you happy can fall into different categories. There's a category of things that make you happy that rely on other people, and then things that make you happy that aren't necessarily good for you. So somebody might say, well, drinking alcohol makes me happy. And then you find out the deleterious effects of health. So that's actually something that makes you happy, but will actually harm you. So you need to separate that. And that's why doing these types of audits are very important, right? So um, we'll get into that. And that's part of personal development. But in terms of learning anything that you want to learn, I'm telling you all right now, YouTube University, y'all. Anything you want to learn, you can learn it on YouTube. I've learned a lot of what I know by watching people on YouTube who've been successful, break down how they were able to be successful. And I will just key in on it for a couple of weeks and I become pretty proficient on it at it and then actually start experimenting so that you don't become someone who's just puppeting and parroting uh, what other people have said. And that's what most people, like with their knowledge base, are just repeating what another person says. It's like actually finding out for themselves how something works, right? Like I could tell you how solar electricity works, but if I don't know how to put together, connect solar panels, then what do I really know? I've had to done it myself and like understand series and parallel wiring and all of that. So it's important to actually try things out. So I don't want to belabor the point. It's been a while. Um, this is four hours. I started at eight o'clock on the dot. I gave four hours of time to y'all. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. I hope that it has been inspiring. And I hope that it has been instructive as to how you want to move in your life. And we'll tune in again tomorrow. And I'll be taking you know calls from people as well. It'll be 8 p.m. tomorrow. Have your family tune in, your children tune in, your mother tune in, your grandma tune in. This is all going to be family friendly, but this will all be something for someone as long as you uh, respect learning and have any type of intellectual curiosity. I think that these lives will be help very helpful for anybody from any walk of life. So thank you all for tuning in. I'll see you all tomorrow at 8 p.m. Bless.